Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Morning. Hi, a little tired. How about you? Yeah, I'm with you on that one a little bit. Web courses was a little slow to open. Anybody else have that problem this morning? Mm, no, I don't know. I don't think so. Wasn't really paying attention. <laughs> Been waiting for the Zoom to start um, since what eight forty-five. So. Oh really? Yeah, I try to be early. <laughs> That's the only bummer about Zoom. You sit there by yourself twiddling your thumbs. If it was a classroom situation, at least you might have someone to talk to. Well, we're here. We're ready. So that's uh, a good crowd. I'm here. Ready. That's a that's a strong term. <laughs> okay. Very well. Not really a morning person. Well, more just <laughs> yeah. as long as I'm awake and I'm not awake right now. <clears throat> All right. Well. Today, I want to talk to you about filters, and that's a pretty unfettered conversation, not a lot of complexity. Um, it's, uh, for the most part, it's a strictly creative discussion. Um, I'll touch a little bit on the aspects of filtration that will affect your um, exposure uh, manipulation and about another, actually, we talk about exposure on Wednesday, so it'll be a little bit of a precursor to that conversation, I suppose. Um, so hang back and enjoy it. Um, this is one of the easier uh, discussions that I'll have with you folks this semester. So um, I thought it's a nice one actually to lead into because you will have, uh, if I share my screen, I just want to talk to you guys about that briefly. Um, you will have a, uh, a midterm quiz, I'm going to call it, not an exam because it's uh, too scary of a word uh, for what this is. Um, so here it is. I think the uh, ultimate due date is the 25th, but it's open as of, uh, I think I open it as of the end of class today. Let's take a look real quick. Let's see what we got here. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Available from, oh, oh, I see, available from Wednesday. So yeah, there's a, probably a couple of questions on the quiz that'll uh, that I'll talk to you about on Wednesday. So it's going to open um, that day and close over here. I always, uh, you know, the, the the closing date, if you're one of those that looks at that page in web courses, is always a little bit after the due date so that um, I don't cut anybody off prematurely. As I noticed that a couple of times I've had some folks, um, not necessarily in this class, but in other classes that'll turn things in at like 1159, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's conceivable that you could get locked out of web courses. So uh, I always have it close a few minutes after the due date. That's why it says July 26. It's actually due July 25th at 1159 p.m. Okay. So you have like four days uh, to do it, five days uh, to do it. It's only 30 questions. Um, the portal stays open for 90 minutes once you hit the start button. Um, and so you've got an hour and a half to answer 30 questions and it's pretty simple. So multiple choice. Um, I've put all your decks up now. So after um, today's session, I'll put deck 1.7 up and I'll put uh, deck 1.9 up on after Wednesday. Um, section 1.8 is your midterm. Section 1.9 is typically the, you know, the week after the midterm, but we don't have that kind of time. So what had to happen was I had to shoehorn your, your midterm quiz in between sections 1.7 and 1.9 in the same week. So that's why I've left it open for five days and you can access it at any point you need to. Okay, so we'll talk about um, exposure on Wednesday. Um, and then you'll have your, your quiz, okay. Um, so that's kind of where, where we're at. So we're here, section 1.7 today, and um, we'll see what's up with that. So um, I want to start talking to you today about filtration. It's a creative process. 
It can also be a corrective process. It can correct exposure. It can correct color balance. Um, and then, it, of course, it can be uh, an enhancement aspect of your cinematography um, with things like diffusions or color enhancers or polarizers. Um, and then, of course, it can be a strictly creative thing as well when we're talking about pure color uh, filtration and effect color filtration, uh, gradual uh, color filtration. We'll talk about all of those here in the, in the course of this lecture. So um, let me go to my, uh, my deck here and we'll jump into it. So this is week seven. We also have, uh, or I'm sorry, not week seven, it's week three, three and a half, right? So um, we're halfway through the course. After this, we're gonna do uh, exposure. Um, we're gonna do composition and, and framing. Um, we'll do some uh, discussions on lighting. Um, and uh, we'll start to have a conversation about shooting for the edit by the end of the uh, semester. Uh, at the end of the summer and and we'll be done. So you've made it through uh, halfway at this point once today is over. So congratulations for that. I hope that's a uh, source of confidence for all of you. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk to you about filters from the point of view of how they connect to the camera because there's several different styles. I wanna talk to you about types as far as correction and, and um, effect filters. Um, and mostly I'm going to cover the gamut of what is what Ira Tiffin once upon a time called the five critical uh, creative filters and focus on those as, as in terms of a discussion um, and, and then allude to some other stuff that you guys can experiment with on your own or explore on your own. Okay, so moving forward, using a filter is a different approach. It can be done digitally now. Um, or it can be done in camera, okay? And the difference between digitally and in camera can be simply uh, your approach intellectually to the process of manufacturing your film, okay? So you can make a decision on the day at the point of conception of your images, you can put a filter on the lens and affect the overall image. Uh, and what we call bake it in uh, to your decision. Or you can do a lot of these filters in post-production and, and sort of defer that, um, that choice until later. Um, so depending on who you are and how you like to work or the kind of environment you're working in, maybe you've got, uh, you know, several different, um, uh, producer administrative types that each get their feedback on things before a project is finalized and, and carried forward to the client. If, if that's the case, you have, you know, discussions maybe at several points along the process of, of, of um, packaging up your film and all of its contents to where you might make decisions and then change your mind and then make other decisions based on those changes. Um, or you might be the kind of uh, independent person who does it in camera with a limited staff and therefore, you know, there's not much of a post-production existence beyond, you know, gathering the content in the first place, in which case you might want to bake these things in. Um, I tend to be a big advocate for baking things into the camera uh, within reason, uh, simply because I know that the, the creative process can be very sort of tenuous in that if you're having a bad day, you know, uh, I think it was, was it Corey that is, is, you know, running low on sleep right now. So your responses to your creative vibe are not the same as they might be on a day where you're fully rested or, you know, if you're sick and not feeling well, your creative juices aren't flowing as freely as they normally would. And so, you know, how you are on the day that you create is very often not the same person you are in post-production. So 
you know, on the day when you're creating the images, if everything is, you know, if you're rested and you're healthy and you're approaching the problem with, you know, a, a, a you know, a vibrant and responsive mind and you feel compelled to do something, I think a lot of times we should listen to those vibes, you know, and therefore if, if you're in a moment and you, and you see something and you feel like you should go ahead and, and affect an, a creative change to that image. Uh, you're, I, I think you're probably right in those impulses. Um, and you, what you may find is on the, on the day that you're shooting an image and you decide that you really probably ought to use some filtration, but you rein that impulse back and you don't do it. Uh, and then maybe, you know, it's several weeks before you get to post-production you know, several days to several weeks. And now you're sitting in an edit suite, maybe you're with your editor and your colorist, and you're looking at the same image on a screen and you're not getting the same vibe you were getting when you were there on location in that moment. And you might not then affect the change that you thought was appropriate at the time you captured that image in the first place. And so that impulse may be lost or maybe altered in some way based on your perspective days or weeks into the future when you're looking at those images with different eyes. So that's why I'm, I'm a real big advocate of making choices in the moment and go ahead and affect those choices. You know, many times the things that we do are fixable or reversible in post, if you will. Um, if you're going to extremes with some of your filtration, you might want to shoot a version with and a version without on the day, if that's the case, um, and then solve your disparity problems that way. Um, but if it's a decision, for instance, to use a polarizer or not, I'm gonna show you what a polarizer does. Um, that's the kind of thing where you, you've kind of got to do it in the moment because you can't really do it later. Um, there are digital tools that can simulate the effects of a polarizing filter. But in post-production, if you haven't used a polarizer and you look at the footage and you think, man, I should have used a polarizing filter, um, the tools that we have to affect that change later in post-production are not as effective as it would have been to use the polarizer on the day. And diffusion filters kind of work the same way. The ones that soften and, and diffuse uh, our lighting or our sunlight or whatever, um, those filters are not as successful in post-production as they are on camera in the moment. So there's some filters that really you should address right then and there. Basic color correction at this point, if you're shooting highly compressed files like ProRes or uh, MP4s, um, or you know if you're packaging .mov files out of your camera or whatever, you may find the flexibility somewhat limited in post-production uh, in terms of changing colors of your image freely. Um, and so the rate of compression will have a lot to do with that. Um, and of course the color depth that you use at the time will have a lot to do with that. For instance, if you shoot on a Sony A7S, A7S2, let's say at eight bit compression, color, uh, color depth, um, you don't have a lot of room for color correction and post-production before you start suffering from inaccuracies. Um, on the other hand, if you shoot um, uncompressed raw codec out of the uh, Ursa Mini, for instance, um, in DaVinci Resolve, you have quite liberal power over your color correction and post and can affect a great deal of change uh, because the color depth and the size of those files is so much bigger. So post-production is a little bit of a sketchy process, depending on the camera you've used, the codec you've selected to shoot with, and then the type of filtration that you opted out of in the moment, okay? So for all these reasons, I think if your creative impulse is to use uh, a graduated filter or a polarizer or um, you know even a color creative filter, I think, you know, it's a combination of your mindset being in the right place, you're in the location, you're being inspired by, you know, uh, so often you can be in inspired by the, you know, the smells of a location, the sights at a location, the, 
you know, just the, you know, the aspect of being in that place in that moment can have a lot to do with how your creative responses are going to react and how, how you're going to take your images. And so I think sometimes when you make decisions under those um, conditions, you probably ought to listen to your impulses at that point. I don't know. How do you guys feel about that? Do you, are you an advocate for in the moment responsing or waiting for later when you have a more sober mindset? I think if, if you're not, Oh, sorry. You can go ahead. Oh, no, no, you're good. You're good. Oh, I was just going to say like, if, if you're not scouting beforehand, if you haven't been to the location, you're doing it in the moment, then of course you would definitely want to leave creative liberties to when you're finally there. Okay. That's a valid point of view. I, I would actually take the, um, like, not, not really the opposite position, but to kind of springboard off that is, yeah, you, you, you know, like scout the location, but if you haven't been to the location, kind of go with your gut and feel it out. But in, in my mind, it would, it wouldn't really make sense to get to the production stage without already knowing, okay, I've scouted this. I know what I'm going to need for my equipment. You know, so when you go to the rental house, you get the right filters, you get the right camera, you get all the things that you're going to want on the shoot. So by the time you get there, there shouldn't really be any room for, oh, I'm going to use this filter here. It should be more of an, I, I plan to use this filter, but now I have an idea to use this other one that could enhance on the day of the shoot, but still to have, have everything planned out ahead of time and then alter the plan as necessary. Yeah, that, that's usually how it happens. So um, the, the conventional wisdom in the industry is um, to always go into a situation with a plan so that when you get there, you can throw the plan away and do what inspires you to do in that moment, if that's the case. If you have an overriding impulse to do something creative after you have sort of made a plan and, and, and how you're going to deal with something on the day, the first thing you should do as a cinematographer is get right with the director and start talking about this, this, this overpowering impulse that you're having, because, you know, it could very well be a, 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 val a valid approach. Um, you go to a location, you scout. So the same situations can apply. You go on a scout, you're tired. You know, I've been on a lot of tech scouts and usually at least on a, on a, on a, on a fairly big feature, all of the department heads will go on a tech scout. They'll get us, two, sometimes three 15 passenger vans. They'll cram us all in vans and, you know, starting at, you know, eight o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning, we start driving around to all the locations on the production schedule to look at these locations and start coming up with a plan for how we're going to act when we get to these spots. Right. And I mean, just that process of tech scouting a lot of times can sap your energy and and your creativity because you're you know you're in a van and early early in the morning against your normal impulses and and you know you're you're crammed in with 14 15 people and you're driving around all over town you know on the map to look at your production locations and and you're seeing a lot of stuff and and details start getting you know kind of muddled in your head and you you take notes as best you can and you talk with your you know, concerned um, uh, folks on the crew, you know, like the gaffer and the DP, the key grip, they're going to get in a huddle, you know, when they get to a location, they're going to start talking about where can we hang lights, you know, where can we put stuff and, you know, can I black these windows out or, you know, can I run dolly track through here, you know, and those conversations are happening and then the DP kind of shifts over to the director and starts talking about what's been going on in the technical huddle and starts talking with the director about the story uh, concerns with the location. And, you know, are these the right hallways and windows? Are, are the walls the right colors and things of that nature? And so you've got a lot going on. So sometimes, you know, when you go into a tech scout, you're, you're going in from a very sober point of view where you simply look at the things you have to work with and you say, okay, so, uh, I know that if we're going to be in the, this location and uh, it's a bright day and the sun's coming through the windows and it looks very nice, but what happens if it's an uh, overcast day uh, on, on the day we come to shoot? I have to have a plan to put lights through the windows. I have to have a plan to you know, boost the, the amount of, uh, of ambient light in the room. So I need lights in the set and outside the set. Uh, if I have lights outside the set, I'm going to need extra crew, blah, blah, blah. 
So a lot of times your creative uh, concerns aren't addressed on a tech scout, right? Because your brain is too busy with logistics and other things. And then that's kind of what pre-production is for. It's like you do your scouting and you make your essential plans and then you start storyboarding and thinking about creative solutions for your problem of manufacturing this film and you start getting ideas. And so in terms of filtration, a lot of times that's where, you know, you might start thinking about, uh, uh, you know, in, in pre-production, you might start thinking about your filter choices and say, you know, I remember that location, go back and look at the snapshots from the location and think to yourself, um, yeah, we're gonna do these things in terms of lighting when we go out on the front porch of this house, for instance, um, we're gonna shoot outside. I might want to have some grad filters ready because it's either going to be a full sun day and we're going to go out there and the sun might be way too bright to balance exposures with things happening under uh, the protection of a front porch or the sky is going to be really um, overcast and there's not going to be much color so I might want to have some color grads to sort of accentuate the color of the sky and breathe a little life into an otherwise you know uh, flat looking exterior. Um, so you might want to have a couple of different types of filters. So then when you get there and you realize, okay, we got the bright sunny day, like we, we thought we were going to get. So I'm going to go with one set of gradual filters, the neutral density ones to help me with exposure, keep the blue sky color in check, but just not as bright so I can balance it with the foreground. Or you get there and you say, oh gosh, it looks like it's about to rain. The, the sky's not blue. It's like this nasty sort of dirty white and there's no, there's no color, no vibrancy here at all. Maybe I'm going to use a, um, you know, a, a sea green uh, gradual filter, or I'm going to use a, uh, a blue, you know, a light blue gradual filter and make the, give the sky a little color, you know. So then you're going to sort of split the time between your creative choices and your technical choices, from what you learned on the tech scout and how you feel when you get there on the day you have to shoot. Okay, does that make sense? So, I think, oh, yeah. so actually, I have a question about that too. <clears throat> in terms of the pre-production, would you go through every single scene, uh, say if you're shooting a feature, uh, or would you wait until you're given a permit to that location and then you start doing your technical analysis? Well, you don't want to buy a permit to a location you're not going to use, right? So permits are for physical production, uh, not for scouting. So when you're on a tech scout, if you know you're going to want aerial work platforms, for instance, for night exterior lighting and stuff uh, in a neighborhood where you're shooting at the house, you're going to plan for that on the tech scout because you're going to see a need, but the gear's not going to be there on that day. So you don't need the permit just to scout. So what you'll do is you'll make a, uh, you'll make a permit request on the tech scout for that location and then tell the location manager what gear you're going to be using that is going to you know, facilitate the need for the for the permit, um, and a lot of times it's as simple as bringing a generator. If you if you go to a location uh, in Los Angeles and you shoot inside of the property for the owner or client that you're dealing with, and you do not bring a generator to the location, sometimes you can get away with not having to buy a permit. But the minute you put a generator out on the street and bring your own power to the set because you're going to use big lights to light through windows. That's it. You're done. You've bought a permit. So you've got to deal with it. Um, so these are the things that you're going to determine on a tech scout. And so filtration is just another one of those tools you have to consider uh, when you start thinking about, you know, your film and how you're going to put it together. Um, so we're going to treat it like, you know, like any other decision we would make, whether it's for lighting or lenses or, you know, supplementary power, or whatever it is. Um, and that's the whole point. So it's decide what kind of manufacturer you are in terms of filmmaking. Do you want to build it all when you get everybody there? Or do you want to save a little bit of work for later um, and defer some creative choices? I'm not a big advocate of deferring creative choices. Sometimes though, the stuff we do in terms of filtration and post can be corrective. You know, you do something on the day and you feel really good about it. And then six weeks later in post, you're looking at that footage and you're with your editor and you're going, man, you know, I wish I hadn't used that, uh, that warming filter. The, the, the whole scene looks just a little bit too warm to my eye now. And that's when your colorist can say, well, we can dial some of that out with software uh, in DaVinci Resolve. So, you know, let me know how far you want to go 
and then we can remove the rest or let me know, you know, um, there's certain things that we can fix and post that will rein in choices we've made on the day. Um, but filtration, like I said, there's a couple of types of filtration that are very hard to affect in post. Polarization and diffusion are specific, two specific ones. Um, so keep that in mind um, and maybe, you know, decide to commit to extreme filters like streak filters and star filters. You can't dial that out after you've done it. It's very, very hard in post, very expensive. Um, so that's something you have to decide on the day. Do we want to use a streak filter on this shot or not? A night exterior, cars driving by, lovers on the corner saying good, good night for the evening or whatever. Nice long anamorphic blue streak filters used for the car headlights that are going by in the background. Do you like that look? You got to sort of commit to it right then and there because later on uh, it'll be there when you use the filter. It'll be there in post six weeks later when you look at that footage. And so that's a conversation you definitely want to have with the director and make sure that you're both on board with that idea and that it's okay to go ahead and commit that in camera. Um, but if it's something as simple as, you know, I'm under a street light and the color temperature, that is something weird, but I don't have the machinery to get up and gel the street light to correct it. Uh, so it doesn't balance with my backlight and then my foreground light uh is is corrupted by a neon sign that's splashing onto the set from across the street and i can't i don't have enough grip stuff to block that out either so i have this mishmash of color temperatures happening on the set um you can get in in post and fix a lot of that stuff later so you don't necessarily have to worry about stuff like that okay so it depends on what filters you're talking about and how you like to work if you want a really extensive conversation on filters, I've put a series of videos on YouTube um, where I talk at, at great length and depth about filters and different styles and so forth. I'm going to sort of distill all five of these videos down into our conversation today. So if you want the full, you know, the full rundown, uh, you can check out those links and uh, see the full conversation on YouTube on my YouTube channel. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so filtration for video. Um, all, you know, all a filter is, is um, it's, a, it's an optical element, it's a piece of glass you're going to put in the optical path between your sensor and what your lens is seeing, okay? And in most cases, your creative filters, if I can show you, for instance, on this Sigma 50 millimeter, I have a, a lens hood and I have a you can kind of see the filter in here. It's a gradual neutral density filter. If I take the lens hood off, you can see how it's a dark filter. It's like sunglasses for your lens. And then of course, here's the, the raw lens itself, right? So in the traditional sense, what filters typically were uh, was just a, an added element, whether it's a color element or a neutral gray element, polarizing element, diffusing element, you would just screw it on the front of your lens. Okay, that was the, the approach photographically that, uh, you know, we took for years. Uh, the problem with that method is a few, and I'm going to sort of describe those in the course of our conversation. But basically, suffice it to say that when I'm talking about a filter, I'm talking about a piece of glass, it's either going to insert in a matte box or thread on the front of your lens in some fashion, and it's going to give you an effect that you can predict uh, based on the filter you've chosen, okay? Some of the filters are darker than others and they will affect your exposure uh, choices you're gonna make. And you'll learn more about that on Wednesday. Um, and uh, there's a huge variety of, of filters and, and what they'll do. So I wanna introduce you to what they are today and give you some sense of what's out there. Filtration for photography and cinematography, is kind of a lost art. Um, in the age of digital, we've sort of taken for granted a lot of things that we can do to the image, and we defer a lot of creative choices to post-production. And I think that that can be a mistake for the reasons that I've cited. Um, you know, there's something to be said for your inner voice, you know, and when you're in a, in a location and your inner voice is saying, you know, I think we should do this thing, um, I think you should listen to that voice because... I think eight times out of 10, it's, it's 
telling you the truth. Okay, so when we're talking about filters, we can talk about these glass elements we're using. Who's making them? Well, one of the biggest uh, brand names in filter manufacturing uh, to this day is the Tiffin uh, Company. Uh, they're currently owned by Schneider Optics. They were bought out, I think, a year and a half, two years ago by Schneider. Schneider is a lens manufacturer, and among other things, they also make matte boxes. Um, so Tiffin grew up as a filter uh, manufacturing company, later got bought out by a larger optical company. Um, but Ira was the uh, founder of the Tiffin Filter Company. Uh, and he has a, an interesting interview um, that he did with Rocket Jump Film School. And I just want to introduce you to Ira Tiffin, the founder of the Tiffin Company. And I'm pretty sure in this video, he talks about what he considers to be the five um, most important filters that you should have in your camera package with you at all times. Whether you use them or not is, is secondary to the notion that you should have at least these five filters in your camera package every time you go out to make a movie, right? These minimum of five, right? And then beyond that, whatever your tastes demand uh, as well. So let me show you Ira Tiffin uh, for a few minutes here. I'm Ira Tiffin. I'm the vice president of the motion picture and television filter division at Schneider Optics. Do you think the tendency to overlook filters is a more modern problem now that we have digital and, and that kind of stuff where filters more um, commonplace during film or has it always been kind of like a uh, almost an afterthought or, or lack of education? That's actually a very good way of phrasing that question. Um, it is an issue that I address time to time in the various seminars that I've done because for the most part, filters are learned later in your learning experience, in your education, becoming a cinematographer or even a still photographer. And the reason for that is you need a camera you need a lens, you need to understand how those work. When you've done all you can with that, and you still want more, that's when you seek out filters. Filters are an aspect of the art and emotional content and the ability to manipulate light content, as well as the technical issues, which you would need to know just in, in understanding T-stops, for instance, or, or focal lengths, yeah. um, understanding filters, and as such, all of that serves to make an individual cameraman more competitive the more he learns and the better he gets at employing the tools that are there. And filters are something that should not be overlooked when you gauge the universe of tools for doing this because there's, there's nothing more powerful than that slim piece of glass in being able to do something with everything else that you're doing, all else being the same, and turn it from something mundane to something magnificent in that Speaking of, what are some of your favorite uses of filters in, in movies? Do you have favorite movies that use filters in a creative way or? I like the first few minutes of Top Gun. <laughs> the ability Jeff Kimball put into building up the drama and the level of energy uh, was brilliant in my opinion starts off underexposed, it's dark to suggest, it's just barely sun up, mm -hmm. but it's enough to see. And he played around with color and with graduated color. And there's oranges and reds and yellows and things that you normally wouldn't see, but they fit in perfectly with the background music, which really wasn't background, it was almost the star of this sequence. Um, why are you introduced to a new world instantly by what he did? And when that color was put in there, it looked ingenious because it's the kind of color that signaled to you that this was no ordinary location. This was no ordinary time. This was something that was really adventurous and exciting. 
And I probably saw that several times before I thought of the color. Because it worked its way into the story so seamlessly that even me, who you would expect to be sensitive and sensitized to seeing this kind of thing, hadn't thought of it as a filter effect mm -hmm. until long after I had seen it. I said, you know what? That was wonderful. But even I didn't realize it. The idea being that when filters are used at their, at their best levels, typically, it's not something that you're sitting there saying, yeah, they used a filter for that. You want it to blend in so that it doesn't draw attention to itself and that it just feels right. There are a lot of technical applications for filters that are there to help you get proper exposure, to control uh, depth of field, that allow you to manipulate certain elements of the scene, like reflections off of windows. This one instance was beyond that. It was just something that you had to be familiar with the capability of color and light and understand um, just how things feel. And so that was an excellent example to me of just feel right use of filters. There's so many filters. There's so many <laughs> filters out there. What are the top five that you think that you would want to keep with you? The range of filters can certainly be bewildering, can it? Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the key obstacles to people putting their foot in the filter water and saying, let, let, me, let me try this out and see what it's like. So I will give what I consider to be the most important five filters. I would start with a very basic concept, and that is that if you're shooting anything where something might get tossed at your lens, whatever it is, could be rain, sand, mud, whatever, the idea is you don't want to damage that front element mm -hmm. of your lens because replacing it's expensive, time consuming. And if you can avoid it easily, use a clear filter. Clear filter for protection, they have traditionally been the most popular filter type. <clears throat> it's just basic common sense. If you do anything outdoors, anything at all, polarizers are really, really useful. There's a lot you can do with polarizers. They have, if you understand how they work, the ability to do things you can't do digitally that you would really enjoy being able to do. Polarizers are famous for deepening a blue sky. You want to deepen a blue sky? Uh, Michael Slovis in Breaking Bad used this many times using our true pole, which has a, a very high polarization efficiency, which made the effect even more dramatic when he would create this deep dark band in the sky that it wasn't natural, but it created this palpable sense of tension and menace in the scene that he used these on that you could not have obtained readily otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and it fit the story so well because you had you know, warring factions meeting on the desert. Without that deep, dark sky where it was, the actors would not have stood out so prominently and so powerfully. And the otherwise, normally to the eye, clear blue would not have had that, that drama mm -hmm. that the filter imparted into it. You, you can darken it in post, but you will be missing some of the detail. You may incorporate some noise, which by the way, is another reason to use an optical solution for manipulating the image as opposed to leaving it all in post because more post manipulation typically incorporates some digital artifacts in particular noise that could be objectionable mm -hmm. and further limits your ability as you use it to fix certain things it diminishes your latitude and range in doing other things mm -hmm. so that if you've done it with an optical approach like a filter you get an image that's going to be much more dramatic and very difficult to replicate afterwards in post mm -hmm. Beyond that is diffusion. The idea of diffusion has to do with um, three key things. You're dealing with sharpness above all, the ability to resolve fine details. And so when you don't want to see the pores on the actor's skin or wrinkles and blemishes, uh, but yet you still want the image to appear in focus, that's a, that's a key thing. It wasn't always the case. You need diffusion. 
looking to tone down harsh contrast. Black is too black, white is too white, and you want to manipulate that. Uh, and then there's a certain degree of halation, of highlight flare, when you see a glow around a brighter area versus a darker area. For the worlds, I believe it was David Mullen. He used a pretty heavy diffusion filter to make almost every single highlight bloom a lot more, and it kind of gave this futuristic, cold, otherworldly feel it was a really interesting effect because it's so noticeable, but because of the tone of the film, it just kind of worked. It fit right in. Yeah. Yeah. I would suggest you take a look at what's out there. I won't tell you you should use this one or that one because there's differences. And I can't say which of those would be more useful to any one individual. It's going to depend on, really, it's, it, it's up to you, a matter of choice and preference. Yeah. And uh, so a diffusion filter, something. What's uh, next on your, your list? I think that uh, graduated neutral density is very important. And neutral densities are very important. The neutral density is important, especially now, because digital sensors have very high sensitivity to light, have what we would call high film speed equivalent. Mm -hmm. And working with filters to take out all the light evenly through the spectrum as neutral density filters are designed to do. When you are trying to direct the attention of the audience to a certain item in the scene, a certain part of the scene, you can do so by putting the foreground and the background out of focus relative to that object so that all the other distracting detail is soft and diffused and not attracting attention to itself. Um, you need to adjust the diaphragm the iris opening to control depth of field to be able to create that effect that you can then say, all right, I can set the T-stop where I want it to get the effect from this lens, the performance level of this lens that I want. And then I can play around with neutral density filters to get the right exposure. Now we need a fifth filter. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest uh, one that's unique to Schneider, which is the Digicon. What that's capable of doing is enhancing the dynamic range of your camera, whatever that happens to be to start with. Um, it has the ability to bring more of the real world into the range that your camera is capable of rendering. And so you can capture upwards of one and a half to two stops of additional dynamic range in many circumstances, which would otherwise be lost. And mm -hmm. so when you're trying to bring more of the real world in, the Digicon is a particularly effective way of doing that. Those would be the five filters I would want to have with me and that I would suggest people take a closer look at as they get started. Um, again, keep it simple. Look at the first major need that you might have. Start with one and then move on from there. Mm -hmm. So start with your story and what you want to want to tell in them. Definitely. That's a lot less intimidating. <laughs> That's good. What are you excited about in terms of the future of, of filter technology and, and the way that the industry is headed and the way cameras and, and lighting are heading? Because it just seems to be changing minute to minute almost. I've been doing this a long time. And what I'm excited about is the fact that I'm still, after all these years, excited about what I'm doing. The reason, apart from any, any personal bias that I might have, is that filters are still relevant. The things that I know and that I've done and that I intend to do are still of importance out there. And that's remarkable. Um, there's no guarantee that that was ever going to be the case when I first got into it. Um, in fact, you know, back in the 70s, it looked like it might be possible when the advent of affordable home video recorders, camcorders, came out that people could just dial in the color and contrast that they wanted. They might not need filters, but that didn't happen. In fact, there was an increased need for filters. And so even with all the digital manipulation that exists today, there is still, I believe, an even more importance associated with filters than, than ever because there are elements of the cameraman retaining control that were not quite as strong as they are today in the past and there are elements of manipulating that image that are even more important now 
because you do have the ability to shoot in the dark. You do have the ability to record a broader range of, of a dynamic range, and yet it's still not all that you can do. You still need some other means of, of taking what a camera and a lens and a light can do and turning it into magic, and filters will help you do that. It turns things into magic. So, powerful parting words there. Filters turn our images into magic. So, um, how do these videos uh, translate on your screen going through the Zoom uh, processor and everything like that? Are you getting clarity and 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 a good volume and everything? I think so. Okay. All right. Good. Well. Obviously, I've put the video on your videos page in web courses, so you can go there and revisit that uh, interview if you want to. Um, I'm just always worried that playing them live through the Zoom filter uh, does something to the quality. So that's good. So <clears throat> any takeaways from that video? Any Anything stand out? Did you hear anything particularly salient to this conversation or your own concerns at this point? I think uh, when it came to the manipulation being done in post-production, I think it was, a, it was a very strong point when he brought up how there are artifacts and noise uh, that remain in unfiltered images. Yeah, some cameras can generate a, a, a large amount of, of digital noise if you create exposures in camera that that push the boundaries of that camera's sensors capabilities. Yeah, sure. Um, it's typically uh, you start seeing things like digital noise in really, really dark images with really, really dim exposures um, because the absence of light creates a lot of computational problems for your sensor. So if you rob the sensor or starve the sensor of available light, um, it's going to be forced to make some sometimes some inappropriate decisions in terms of assigning color values to the pixels that you know were starved of light. Uh, and it may make some bad decisions, some wrong decisions. And then you end up with colored noise and you end up with you know signal to noise problems that um, you don't get at you know with brighter, excuse me, brighter images and so forth. Um, that can also happen um, in post if you do too much color correction, for instance, or too much contrast adjustment, um, you can introduce noise into your original files that didn't exist previously. Um, and so you have to be careful in both instances about things like noise. Um, but specifically about filters themselves, did you gather or gain any wisdom from his interview? Or, you know, is it pretty much, uh, is it resonating with you yet? I, yeah, I definitely personally, I took down a lot of notes when it came to each of the filters. The only one I didn't seem to fully understand was the neutral density filter. But aside from that, I think I have a pretty good grasp of each one. We're going to get into the ND filter here pretty, pretty soon. So stand by on that note. Uh, anybody else uh, in terms of filters and what Ira had to offer as far as his input? Okay. I'm trying to to mirror his sentiments with my own presentation, so that might be why um, there's not much response to it. But um, if something comes up, or if you you know, if something occurs to you, feel free to uh, to jump in. So I'm going to talk to you about um, different ways of connecting filters to your camera. We'll start with that conversation, and then we'll we'll start looking at specific types of filters. So we have several different ways of connecting to the camera. We have the threaded rounds, which I showed you uh, initially a minute ago with that um, variable neutral density. Let me show you another one. So threaded round filters come in a lot of different flavors. Okay, so here's a warming filter from, uh, I think this is from a company called B&W. Yeah, this is, um, what we would call a warming filter. It has a number designation or a catalog designation. Um, it is, uh, this one is a 81A. 
Uh, I have a white card here because that's sometimes the easiest way to show you what a filter like this does. If I just hold it up, you can see that there's there's glass and a metal retaining ring. That much is clear from the from the video, but it's hard to see the effect of this filter unless I give you a white card and then I hold the filter in front of it. Do you see how the area behind the filtered glass has a warmer quality to it than the white card? Can you is that translating on your screen? Okay, this is a very subtle filter. It's a very subtle effect. Okay, but when you're in post and you have a lot of things you have to get done in a very short amount of time, for instance, if you decide that it's your film is best suited doing color correction at Technicolor in LA and Technicolor wants $400 an hour to do whatever it is you're going to do to your film and you're going to go in there for one or two days of intense prep and correction of your content to be packaged into your into your release print or your 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 DCP files or whatever you're producing sometimes doing basic subtle adjustments uh, is an extravagant waste of your budget and your your time is better spent doing the really uh, extreme stuff that you could only do at Technicolor uh, and leave the other stuff to either a secondary editor and colorist or you can do these things in, in camera. And a warming filter is one of those things that's really easy to toss on the front of the camera. If you're photographing someone, for instance, who doesn't have a lot of color to their to their reflectivity, to their skin tone. And you can add something like an 81A and it just dials in just a bit of tone to the skin that can be very flattering and, can, and it can restore a vibrancy to the overall image. And that's something you would probably do on a close up, for instance, and a wide shot, it's not as important. But when you're right up in there, and if any of you have started your shooting assignment yet, you'll realize when you do a close up that you gotta get right up in there on your subject. And a lot can be revealed in a close-up that you may or may not approve of. And so a warming filter is one of those things you can add to the lens and it will just, you know, restore a little vibrancy. So this is a threaded round filter. Uh, typically they're marked on the on the edge of the retaining ring. So this one's B&W made in Germany. Uh, on the inside of the filter flange on B&W filters is where they tell you what filter that is. So you can see 81A actually. 81A, okay, BMW 77E is the accessory size. Okay, so if I had my, for instance, uh, trusty 11 to 16 mil, right, that has a 77 accessory size. So the BMW filter screws directly on the front of my Sigma 11 to 16, or my Tokina 11 to 16. Okay, and that filter will now affect whatever this lens is seeing. Okay, so the threaded filter, like I said, that was the original kind of technology that we were using um, to put these additional optical elements into our optical path. Um, we have other styles, though. We have the drop in round series filters, which are the same as threaded rounds, but they don't have a threaded edge on them. It's just a, a filter that has a, a, a metallic edge. And I, I thought I had a, a series holder here. I guess I don't. Um, it, it, it involves a two-piece holder um, where your piece of glass is sandwiched between two other rings, screws together to hold the filter in place, and that screws on the front of the lens. That was uh, an early initial design that somebody thought was a good idea, but to me seems to involve two additional steps. Um, it's a lot easier to have a, uh, a threaded round where everything is integrated and you just screw that whole system right on the front of the camera uh, as such. Um, we don't, you're not gonna see series six, nine and 138s pretty much anymore. Um, the only series drop-in that I have seen in recent years is remains the 138 um, because Panavision, all the Panavision matte boxes, stuff like this, uh, take on the backside a 138 millimeter drop-in polarizing filter, which has a retaining ring similar to this. And the filter drops inside and you lock it down with a ring, you put that on your lens 
and the 138 is your polarizing filter. That's the only 138 that I've really and practically used uh, maybe in the past 20 years, okay? Um, the rest of these series six and nine, they're pretty rare. Really old film cameras that use lenses that don't have threaded fronts, like the manufacturer has to cooperate with your filter sensibility by offering you a lens that actually has a threaded accessory retaining ring on the front. If that doesn't exist, and there are some cinema lenses that don't have that, you have to employ a different system of, of attaching your filters to the lens. So um, if that's the case, uh, we're gonna need things like these gelatin ratten filters or our cut filters, whether they're resin or glass cut filters. And then we're gonna employ something like a matte box. And we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? Um, so threaded round filters. And the, one of the drawbacks of threaded round filters is their size is what it is, right? So my, to, my Tokina 11 to 16 is a 77 millimeter uh, accessory size, okay? Seven, 77 millimeters in diameter, all right? Now, let's say I wanna use my Olympus 50 millimeter lens um, and it has an accessory size of 49 millimeters, right? So that's a couple of different filter sizes. So that's a problem, right? If you're investing in threaded round filters, then the initial impulse was, oh gosh, I've got lenses with different accessory sizes. Now I need to get two or three versions of every filter for all the different size lenses I have. You can do that, it gets a little costly. Uh, the other thing you can do is employ something called a step-up ring. And there's a sort of a visual here uh, in my PowerPoint. Um, it shows you how the step-up ring will attach to the front of various size lenses and allow you to use the same filter if you select the largest possible size. You can use the same filter on different size lenses. So here is um, what they call a nest of step-up filters, right? If you look at the edge markings on these, you'll say it, you'll see how it's some millimeter to some millimeter, right? So at the top, you got 77 to 82, right? So this is designed to take a lens with a 77 millimeter front and allow you to do a couple of different things. Either use an 82 millimeter filter, which you may have, but more importantly for my map boxes, uh, this is a very important step up ring because it goes from my lenses with 77 millimeter fronts and it puts an 82 millimeter accessory size on the outside now. It has changed that lens from 77 to 82 millimeter accessory. And when I do that, the retaining ring on my map box is, I think I told you guys the other day, 82 millimeters. So the protective ring that goes around my lens and allows me to lock the map box to the front of my cinema zoom or my cinema prime has a cowling that goes from 82 millimeters, which is the threaded accessory on the back size, 82 millimeters to 95, which is the inset on the map box itself. It ends up being a little bit of a flare right there, you can see. All right, so I would take you know, my 77 millimeter uh, step up ring and attach it to the matte box flared adapter. Marry that to the Tokina. Now I can mount that to the camera and then mount the matte box to this flared accessory and lock the whole system in, okay? So step up rings can do different things depending on what sort of equipment package you're trying to manage, okay? And with the, you know, in particular with these, these uh, century map boxes, you can see that without this flared adapter, the inside throat, we call it, of the map box is really, really large. And it doesn't marry up with my 77 millimeter lenses, okay? So this flared adapter is necessary if I wanted to lock that whole system together, right? Now I can, put the matte box on the lens with a 77 millimeter compatibility, okay?
Is that, um, does anybody find that concept uh, confusing or anything? Sometimes the step up rings are a little bit of a... Um, I wouldn't say confusing. The, 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 the idea of adapting the lens to actually fit with the filter makes sense. But um, I remember in the uh, videos and in the, the reading and such, they mentioned a, a square version of the filters that would be used in uh, different things. So I was just wondering, like, that's that coming. Seemed... <laughs> that's coming. <laughs> Don't get ahead of me. Right. <laughs> All right, so you remember I talked about my 50 millimeter Olympus lens with the 49 millimeter accessory size. So I have a series of step up rings here. And if you'll notice, the smallest one is 49 millimeter to something. It's 49 to 52 millimeters, right? If I keep stacking, I can go all the way from 49 millimeter all the way up to my... Uh, Actually, I'll take one of these off. 77 to 82 is too big. 72 to 77 millimeter. I end up with this kind of ridiculous cone of step up rings. But what that could do, and this is the worst case scenario, right? Is take a very small lens like this and allow me to use my 77 millimeter threaded round filter on my tiny 50 millimeter prime lens. And just take my BMW and thread it right on the front. Now it's kind of the worst case scenario in terms of using step up rings because you're using a whole handful of them to get you incrementally from 49 millimeters to 77. All right, but you can do it that way. You can also go straight to a 49 to 77 millimeter uh, adapter ring, which I don't know if I have, um, but you'll see over here on the far left of this image, you can see it's a smaller diameter, probably 52 in the case of this. Uh, is that a Lumix lens? No, that might be 49. 49 to some outer diameter, which is much, much larger. Okay, you can get step up rings that will uh, allow you to bypass a lot of these in between sizes and go right from, say, 49 to 77. It'd be a slightly different looking filter, something along the lines of what I've got in these packages here with a much wider uh, flange on them. Okay, but you can do it. So there's a couple of different ways. And, and when you uh, employ, you know, the step up rings in this case, what it allows you to do is just buy one set of filters, buy the filter that will fit on your largest lens. So in this case, I try to keep my, my lenses to a maximum of 77. For the most part, I've been successful in doing that. Um, I've noticed that my cinema zooms like from DZO, they're 82 natively in the front. So with those lenses, I'm pretty much decided that if I'm using those lenses, I'm going to be using a matte box with the square filters, which we'll talk about in a minute. But for all of my cinema primes, like all of my Rokinons and stuff, the largest they go is 77 millimeter. So uh, in that case, I can buy one set of 77 millimeter rounds and then just use step up rings to accommodate any of my vintage lenses or lenses where the sizes vary from that 77 millimeter standard. Okay. All right, so that's step up rings. Uh, the, here's a series, uh, series, this looks like a series nine adapter. Uh, so here's a series nine uh, threaded or non-threaded filter rather. And you see there's a split ring. So there's a top ring that threads onto the front of the filter. All right, and then there is a an inserted ring here. It's got a like a tray essentially in here. And you're gonna use a series filter on a lens that doesn't have a threaded, a threaded ring on the front to receive a filter like this one, right? And you can see there's a little lockdown knob. So a lot of cinema lenses used to be like that um, where they don't have, let's see if I have, Okay, so like for instance, um, this is a rehoused 50 millimeter Canon lens and it went from a lens roughly the size of my Olympus 50 millimeter to 114 millimeter uh, cinema size barrel so that I can get all these additional focus uh, measurements on the barrel itself to aid in follow focusing. But look how big that front, that front, that front uh, 
uh, cowling is now, right? The 50 millimeter lens is inset inside here and the outside doesn't have a threaded accessory. The only thing you could do would be to take something over the overall and lock it down with a little knob, which is basically what this series nine filter is doing uh, for a slightly smaller lens. Um, but that's the idea, right? Some lenses don't have a threaded uh, way of threading a filter onto the front. And so you need one of these um, series drop-in adapters to mount over the front of your, your lens, okay? And then it gives you a little tray you can drop stuff into and it'll hold it in front of your, your cinema lens. That's kind of, again, it's, it's adding a lot of steps to a process that's much easily, more easily facilitated by a map box. And I'm gonna to talk to you guys about map boxes here in a few minutes. Before I talk to you about the cut glass map box, I wanna show you um, a couple of charts. So this is actually, you know what, let's skip that. That's, this is all, it's interesting, but it's not really relevant to a contemporary conversation at this point. Um, if we were using vintage film cameras, you would want to know all the different sizes of series filters that are available and what their diameters are. But in this conversation, I think it's a little mute at this point. Um, Kodak Rattan filters. So that's one of the other filter styles that are out there. So the Rattan filters are simply um, a gel, essentially, an acetate that has been sort of... Um, imbibed with dye so that the, the, the gelatin itself will have the color flavor of the filter that you would be using. So for instance, here's an 85 uh, uh, Rattan gel. And here is, for instance, a cut resin filter that's also 85. You can see they're basically the same filter. This one's a little, not as quite as dense as the one on your screen. But here's a, uh, this is an 85, uh, I think this is an 85B. And uh, this is an 85A on your screen. So the A is a little denser than the B. And then there's a C value, which is less lighter in color than the B value. So you get, you get three grades of an 85 filter, an A, B, and C. And it's, you know, dense, less dense, and ultimately the least dense between the three orange filters. So this is a cut resin filter, okay? Is that usually how that system works, A, B, C? Uh, oftentimes, or one, two, three, four, I think is more of the conventional way of doing things. Um, so you get grade one, which is usually, um, if, you, if you're talking about grades from one to four, four would be the, the most dense effect and one would be the least dense effect. Uh, sometimes you have filters that start at one eighth of the effect and go in steps, eighth, quarter, half, and full density or density one, meaning full density, right? And diffusion usually works that way. Color filters usually go one, two, three, four. Diffusion filters and neutral density filters will go eighth, quarter, half, full or one, right? Um, and that's just a way for you to get a sense of, you know, the, the amount of effect that's occurring with each type of filter. But the Rattan filter is an acetate, uh, and you would use a filter holder like so. And the old film cameras are really the culprits here. These are the cameras that are going to use a, a, a Rattan filter tray like this, specifically the Panaflex film cameras, for instance. So if you're still out there, working on a camera crew with a DP who likes to shoot film and you're shooting on Panaflex cameras, you're gonna be investing in Kodak rat and color correction gels. Um, and you're gonna use the Panavision filter tray, which is similar to this one. This one's from an Aerie camera or a, no, actually, I think this is from a Bolex camera. Uh, and basically what you do is you trim off a little piece of the gel and you put it in this filter holder. And then that filter holder is gonna insert in the camera behind the lens somewhere. In the case of a Panavision, there's a little door near the lens flange, a little door on the side of the camera. You slide it back with your thumbnail and there's a little slit and you take that filter holder and you slide it into the, into the slit and then you close the little door to keep any light from leaking in. And that's how you would apply 
an 85 uh, filter to a Panaflex film camera. What's an 85 filter do? Uh, in the case of shooting film, uh, what you'll do is if you, if you buy a lot of film stock for shooting on stage, it's all um, balanced for your stage lighting, which is kind of a warm, natural color quality to it. We can talk about Kelvin temperatures here in a little while. Um, but essentially, your, your lenses balanced for use on stage have a different native color saturation than sunlight. So if you go out of the stage with a film camera loaded with what we call tungsten film, which is designed to work with your tungsten lighting on stage, and you want to shoot outdoors during daylight, you need to put an 85 filter in front of the lens or before the light strikes the optical plane, the, the film plane, so that the color gel can restore the correct color balance and saturation to the outdoor light hitting a film that is designed to work under artificial lighting, okay? Now, in, in modern digital times, what we have are cameras that will ask us, what color light are you shooting under? And you dial that information into the camera and the camera's sensor will then look at that light with that color bias in mind. So if you tell this camera, I'm gonna be shooting on stage 28 at Sony using artificial lighting, you dial that color temperature into the camera uh, the camera will see that artificial light as though it were neutral white light, okay? Or conversely, you can tell the camera, okay, uh, now we're gonna leave stage 28 at Sony, we're gonna drive to the beach and we're gonna shoot at Santa Monica Pier um, after lunch. Well, Santa Monica Pier is bathed in daylight because you're outside. The camera needs to know you've changed from an indoor color bias to an outdoor color bias, you dial that information into the camera and the camera will now see the sunlight at Santa Monica Pier as white neutral light, okay? So that's color correction. That's what we call color correction. And that is one of the principal uh, duties of some of our filters is to color correct our, our native sensitivity to, of the camera from either indoor lighting sensitivity to outdoor lighting sensitivity. And the 85 was the filter you needed to take a film camera outside and shoot under daylight with film stock that was balanced for lighting on stage. Okay. Um, since there's a, a continuing rise in the use of digital um, versus analog, right? Obviously analog film is still gonna be used, but since more and more is going with digital, does that sort of make the 85 filter not necessarily obsolete, but sort of relegated to a film stock only environment of, okay, if you're working with a, with a director that only shoots on film, right, then you would make sure to have an 85 in your kit because you'd need that. But if you're going to shoot with a guy that's digital, then you don't really got to worry about that because it's, it's all on the camera. The camera's got it. Yeah, the camera's internal bias now, it's called CCT, okay, corrected color temperature the camera's bias now can be altered through a menu. You can say, I'm shooting under artificial light. I'm shooting under daylight. I'm shooting under overcast open sun. I'm shooting under um, fluorescent lighting in a bank, let's say. Um, or you can give it a specific color temperature and we're gonna talk about color temperatures later. Um, you can give it a specific color threshold set of frequencies that you want the camera to correct for and the digital camera will do it all with algorithm right so it, it makes color correction filters in the digital age a bit superfluous yes so in 85 you no longer need an 85 filter to simply go from stage 28 out to the beach with the same camera without changing your media or anything just tell the camera you've gone outside and, and make that adjustment and it will it will internally adjust for you. But you can still use an 85 as a as a, a light orange filter if you wanted to have an orange color effect, for instance. Right. So, like, so you guys saw oh. 2049, right? You see Blade Runner right. 2049 and and uh um uh uh Ryan is walking through the street of Vegas and he's looking for Harrison Ford 
and it's all orange everywhere, right? There you go, right? You can add that over the camera overall um, and shoot and get that interesting color effect. Or you could shoot it all neutral and add that orange color in post later. You have a lot of flexibility with color correction filters in the digital age. So that's one of those areas where uh, digital has given us incredible powers over our media uh, that we never had before. Okay. So, so because the camera, the, the, the digital uh, camera is now sort of taking on the job of like balancing everything to a base level, right? To get a nice foundational image, everything's balanced correctly. Now you can still use the filter, but as a more artistic piece rather than a corrective piece. It's like if yeah. I throw this filter on top of an already balanced thing, I can get a different shading, um, sort of like in uh, Logan where they had certain scenes, I, I don't know what they shot on, but they had a, this kind of really blue hue to a lot of the scenes to really bring down the theme. And yeah. it's just like, uh, especially like his death scene in the woods or whatever, it's just this really, it's not a deep blue, but it's, you can tell it's an unnatural blue for the setting they're in, but it works for the narrative and it just, it brings everything down a notch. Yeah, so you're right in terms of color correction. Okay, when you're talking about helping the camera see your lighting in neutral terms without any color bias. Color correction is now superfluous to digital cameras because the cameras, like I said, you can choose through a menu how you want that camera to see the light and it will render that way. Now, in your specific reference to Logan, for instance, in the days of film, if we wanted to have that blue overall effect, what we would do is we would take that camera with the film balance for indoor lighting and we'd take it outside and shoot in the woods without the 85 filter. And when you and when you didn't put the 85 filter in front of the lens, shooting tungsten balanced film stock outside, the images all looked uh, light blue and in, in color contra in color quality, right? And then if the light blue quality of shooting without the 85 filter wasn't enough. Uh, we would do something called toning in the developing of the negative in post-production. And we would use something like maybe selenium uh, after the basic developing bath, uh, we would add a selenium toner to the negative and that would introduce an even more blue saturation to the resulting image. Okay, and that would be how you would get that blue effect. And then in post-production, when you were in your, um, digital intermediate stage, you would take that blue and you could subtly adjust the hue of blue that resulted from the toning or from the lack of filtration, or you can increase the density even more of the blue effect, or you could rein it back a little bit by desaturating it a little bit. And so you would use each step in the process to gradually get you from neutral balanced lighting rendered by your camera slightly blue, more blue, and definitely blue in post-production with lack of, lack of or additional corrective filtration, toning of the negative in the development process, and then in the digital intermediate process where you go from film to a digital file to add your effects before you go back to film for projection, you could adjust the blue values even more in post. Okay, now in digital, what we do is we simply tell the camera, indoor light or outdoor light or some measure in between and the camera will make that adjustment for us and then we shoot all our images with neutral color balance okay and when we want to affect the color qualities um, like 2049 could very easily have been done in post they might have shot that neutral and turned it orange in post completely orange in post um, I suspect knowing Roger and how he likes to shoot that he added some filtration on the camera initially to have a sense of where that image was going and then finished the orange effect in post. Okay, and controlled the saturation and the density of orange later in post based on what he started in the camera with a filter. Okay. Um, so that's kind of where we can get with digital technologies. We, we end up with all of these ways of handling a problem. Instead of having one linear solution path, we now have you know, like branches in a tree. We have all these different avenues we can take to affect these effects or changes that we want in our film manufacture. 
to get these effects that we're looking for. So digital has really empowered us in that way. Um, it's really kind of an exciting time uh, with regard to uh, how we can manipulate our images. Um, here's a brief list of all the different kinds of color correction that were, are available through Kodak and the Rat and Gelatin's uh, filter system. And like I said, if you're somebody who's going to be shooting film, if you're an experimental filmmaker, for instance, if you're going to take experimental film here at UCF, you're going to need to know about color correction filters. Um, if you're going to be on a film crew later uh, professionally that shoots on film still, you're definitely going to want to know what the Kodak Rattan filter selection looks like uh, because your DP is going to be relying on that tool as well as other tools uh, to create his images. So here's a list of the Rattans and it tells you basically what the effect is with each of those filters. So you can go from filters that correct from full indoor to full outdoor right? Uh, they correct, they add a little bit of blue, more blue or a lot of blue. Uh, they add a little bit of orange, more orange or a lot of orange. Um, and then there's varying degrees of, of other Rattan filters. And then there are colors outside of the strictly orange correction of, uh, of um, what we call um, CTO filters or uh, 80, uh, 81 series filters. Um, those filters have a specific frequency, right, of orange or a specific frequency of blue because they're calibrated correction filters. But sometimes you just want an orange filter, you know, and it's not for correction. It's just for woohoo, orange, you know, whatever. Like 2049, you know, it could very easily have been an amber filter that was put in front of the lens to start that effect in camera. And then they tweaked it in post to get the right density of orange that they were looking for. Right. So amber is not a color correction filter so much as it is an aesthetic uh, effect filter. Okay. So those are rattan gels. Remember, those are the ones that are trimmable acetate. Okay. And that leads us to resin cut filters and cut glass filters. Okay. And these are the square ones that you mentioned earlier. Okay. With the Koken series, for instance, and these are Koken filters. Okay, they, they kind of you know, they come in little plastic boxes like this. They come in a couple of different sizes. They have series A and series P. A was the amateur designation, P was the professional designation. And the whole reason for differentiation was in the old days um, of say 35 millimeter still photography. Um, the cameras that the novices bought tended to have lenses that were a little bit smaller in accessory size, physically a little bit smaller, because when you're on vacation and you're just taking snaps of the family, you don't want to be hauling around this giant professional size camera with its heavy accessories and heavy, large, heavy lenses. You wanted something smaller and lighter that you could just run around Disney World with, for instance. So the amateur cameras had a tendency to have smaller accessory sizes. So there was a series of A size filters that were only about, um, about one and three quarters or two inches square, okay? But the professional lenses had larger accessory sizes like 77, 82, 90, 92, 95, okay? Then you needed a larger series of square filters that would simply cover the front of the lens physically and then allow for the addition of some kind of uh, filter holder that could secure this to the front of the lens so that you could shoot with it and not have to sit there and hold it like a fool, right? Like I'm doing. Uh, so the Koken series of filters involved uh, a two-step process for integrating your filter to your lens. The first was determine what the accessory size of your lens is. So in this case, I've got a Tokina 11 to 16. And so I need, I know this is a 77 millimeter accessory size. So I need a 77 millimeter Koken adapter ring. And what that is, if you can see on edge, you see how it's got a kind of a flared lip on it. And then it's got a threaded channel on the back side. So the threaded side goes onto the front of your lens like a normal threaded filter would but the addition of that little flared edge right there 
is where my filter holder is going to grab onto the front of this lens. So here's the Koken filter holder. And what I'll do is it's got a it's got a receiving channel on the back side of the filter holder. I'm just going to slide that groove into the filter holder and it's going to click in place and secure the holder to the front of my lens. Now I can take any one of my Koken cut resin filters and just slide them into these grooves on the filter holder itself. You see those grooves right there? Just slide that filter in the set of the grooves. And now my non-threaded cut resin square filter is mounting to the front of my uh, Tokina 11 to 16, like so. See that? It's pretty cool, eh? It's kind of like a matte box in a lot of ways. Uh, you see there's little um, sort of knobs or nubs on the outside of this and little recessed holes. There's actually a, a, a hood system that will clip on the front of this holder and act like a cowling to prevent stray sunlight from uh, causing flares by reflecting off your filter and into your lens. Uh, so you can use this system a lot like the way a matte box works uh, and then you don't have to worry about buying different sizes of filters. All the P-series filters are the same size. So you make sure that your lens will be covered by P-series filters, whatever they are, and then just use your filter holder to hold them in place. Sorry about that noise. It's the uh, garbage guys coming around my neighborhood. <laughs> All right, so this is a neat system. I used this system early on in my photographic career because I, I noticed right away the economic advantage of only having to buy one set of filters. And then all you needed to have at that point is, you know, the same filter holder can go from lens to lens to lens. All you need is a selection of adapter rings, which are a lot cheaper than buying the filters themselves. The filter might cost say $35, but the adapter ring might only be six bucks from the photo store. So I'd rather buy a handful of rings than a handful of the same filter over and over again. All right, so that's the Koken system. And I think it works pretty well. And I think, for instance, if you were going to use it on something like your, um, your FZ1000, if you wanted to keep things neat and tidy, um, because you have this excuse me, pronounced tulip sunshade or, or lens hood, you have to take that off so you can access the accessory size on the front of the lens. You can see I've, what I've already done here with this camera is I've put a protective glass filter, a clear one like Ira was talking about, in front of my lens to protect the native front element from damage. So I have a, a clear filter, clear protective filter threaded on the front just to protect the lens itself. It has no effect. It's just for protection. But my accessory size is preserved on the front side of the filter. So I can stack more stuff on top of this clear filter if I want to. Another filter of the same size, or in this case, this filter is 70, 62. So what I would need is a 62 millimeter uh, Koken ring uh, I don't have my Koken rings handy, but what I do have is a Koken filter holder with a 77. So I can take this 77 millimeter system and adapt it to 62 by using a step up ring. So if I get my step up rings back out and I look and see, I might have 62 to 77 already. And if not, what we can do is uh, just adapt it the other way with this nested set that's still on my Olympus lens. I take this off. If I look for 77, 77 to 72, 72 to 67, 67 to 62. It's three step up rings. So I'll remove everything else. And I'll take these three and I'll pop them onto my 77 millimeter Koken adapter ring. And I'll get something that looks like this. Let's 
see that. And then that can go on the front of my Panasonic FZ1000, just like that. And the whole thing is designed to spin freely. So there it is adapted to my FZ1000, okay? And that works pretty easily, pretty quickly to use the Coke and filter system on the front of the FZ1000 which could be a really cool idea, you know, for the sake of the polarizers, the neutral density filters, the neutral density grad filters, the diffusion filters. Um, here's an interesting system. And the cool thing about Coke and filters is when they first came out, I remember they were quite expensive because they were coming from and being manufactured in France. Um, and you know, that was a very kind of an expensive proposition, um, but you can buy uh, Coke and style filter systems now off of Amazon or off of eBay um, for really, really cheap prices. And it's a lot of fun. So like for the $30 I used to pay for one Coke and filter from France, you can now get a whole set of stuff, filter adapter rings, uh, filter holders, and a variety, a small variety of effect filters for the same 30, $35 off of eBay, for instance. Um, and you can play around with filters for a relatively small investment um, that's not gonna break the bank, you know, because choices that you make for creativity are often secondary to choices you make for out of necessity in terms of your budget. And filters is a lot of times one of the things that production managers will try to eliminate from a really, really low budget because the majority of things you do with filters technically can be done in post. And so the logic there is, well, if we have to do post anyway on the low budget feature, uh, but we can eliminate using filters on the set so we can reduce the amount of rental expense, reduce the amount of time taken to use filters on set and divert all of that effort to post where we're gonna be anyway, uh, we can save some money on the budget. If that's the case, you may find the production manager trying to write the filters out of your out of your out of your film budget. So if you want to use filters and you have specific reasons for doing so, you're going to want to address that issue in pre-production with your production manager and make sure that they leave a little bit of money in the budget for renting filters. Okay. Or buying filters. You know, I suggest if you're if you're looking at cinematography as a possible career path, there are things that you can invest in as a, even as a camera assistant and later as a cinematographer that will increase your, the added value of your income by giving you something to rent to production. Filters is one of those things. Um, light meters, filters, camera accessories, um, stuff that you can own at relatively little expense, but as a kit, we call it, um, the combination of all of those things in a, in, in a kit box, you'll rent to production for extra 50 or extra $100 a week, let's say. In some cases, a kit rental can be as much as $250 a week, uh, depending on what's in it. And uh, that's a way for, for instance, the cinematographer to add $250 worth of income to his paycheck every week. Okay, so if you are in a position where you elect to buy filters, understand that you can write them off your taxes because you're a filmmaker and it's a tool for your job. You can rent them back to production and make your the cost of your investment back over time. Uh, and then it, it you know it's added value that comes with you as uh, a DP candidate when people are looking for somebody to hire to shoot a movie, right? You say, yeah, this guy, he's talented. Uh, his work looks really good and he comes saddled with his own lenses, his own filters and everything and makes it really kind of easy for us, hire him and half of our rental responsibilities are also taken care of because he's bringing it all with him, right? So there's no interesting business aspects to wanting to own your own filters as well. But does anybody have any question about the Coke and filters? As Ira was saying in his, in his interview, there are literally hundreds of different kinds of filters you used to get one of these catalogs when you bought a basic uh, adapter 
and an adapter ring from Coke, and it came in a plastic blister pack. And uh, it was the adapter ring, the filter holder, and then the, the uh, catalog, which shows you all the different Coke and filters that are available. Got it upside down. Uh, and you can see there's, you know, there's, there's literally dozens of them. Okay, on the back side, it shows you basically at the time of printing, which in this case, I think was eight, 1985, um, there were that many Coke and filters available in the series, right? And so um, lots of choices, lots of variety, lots of flexibility and creativity. And uh, it was really up to you and your imagination how far you wanted to take the, uh, the Coke and filtration uh, problem when you're uh, making your images. And, you know, pretty much all the filter manufacturers are going to have their own catalog with, you know, dozens of choices and styles and flavors and densities of filters. And it really comes down to preference, you know, uh, do you have a brand preference? Do you have um, a filter effect preference? Um, what is it? And then you pick the series of filters that fits best, gives you the best flexibility and options. Um, at this point in time, I'd say whether you're getting cut glass, which I'm going to talk to you about next, or even threaded filters, I think that uh, the Tiffin company right now has probably the broadest selection of variety to choose from uh, in terms of color correction and effects and diffusions and neutral densities. So um, that you could consider Tiffin, you know, your you know, your, your ultimate choice in terms of variety and connectivity and all of that. Um, and then beyond that, there are other companies, uh, B&W is still out there, but their filters are very expensive because they're handmade in, in Germany. Um, but you also have um, Hoya filters, you have um, uh, ProMaster filters, you have um, format filters, um, uh, uh, um, KNF Concept is a new company that's come along that makes decent filters. Um, and then there's lots of generic filters you can buy off Amazon and eBay as well. So lots of choices in terms of filtration. So that was Koken. And the last kind of filter I want to talk to you about is what we call cut glass filters. Okay, and cut glass just means that it's it's been cut out of a larger, uh, a larger pore, okay? And then the, the best, most optically clear sections of that pore when the glass is cooled and, and, and dry and, and back in a solid state, they take the premium section of that sheet of glass and they carve out filters in four by four inch, four by 5.65 inch uh, and six by six inch and depending on what map box system you're using or lens system you're using, you might want four by four or four by five, six, five or six by six. Okay. As a brand, the Panavision filters were all four by 5.65 for the most part. If you were shooting for television, you know, that series of lenses, the lenses we call the spherical um, optics, you would use four by 5.65 inches. And if you were shooting a theatrical presentation with big anamorphic lenses with wide fields of view, uh, you might want a six by six matte box and use six by six glass filters because they're just physically larger. Okay, and they can accommodate the larger front elements of these big anamorphic theatrical lenses. And then four by four was for 16 millimeter or for um, small spherical 35 millimeter shoots. Uh, a four inch by four inch square filter was that uh, solution. Um, in the age of digital and the sizes of the lenses that are available for digital, given that the largest seems to be 77 millimeter for the most part, I have found that the four by four filters are the best fit. So like my matte box for my Ursa Mini is a four by four matte box, which means the filters that will drop inside this matte box in these trays back here, will hold a filter that is uh, four by four inches square. And if I check the front stage here, I can't get it out. It's stuck. Let's see. 
Okay, this filter stage, you can see the hole inside is four by, by four inches. And I can prove it to you with a hard tape if I have it handy. Where's my hard tape? There it is. Okay. So here's your filter. And you can see that it's four inches by four inches. Okay. Which is pretty good size. Like I said, it'll cover uh, digital uh, completely and, and quite well. So if we're talking about covering the front of the Rokinon lens, there's plenty, there's plenty of coverage there on the front of that Rokinon 35. So that's not a problem. What I have in this tray is another version of a clear glass filter. So you remember how I had a clear glass filter on the front of my FZ1000, the built-in lens? I got another clear filter here that I keep in the matte box when I'm not using any other kinds of filters and that protects the front of whatever cinema lens I've got mounted to the Ursa. Okay, in this case, it's the, it's the uh, Rokinon 35 millimeter prime right here, okay? Um, and the reason is the Rokinon lens cost me uh, about $750, right? The optical flat, even in four by four inch cut glass is only uh, about 125. So even if I completely shattered this thing, uh, I could replace it for far less than I would have to replace my actual lens for. So if I was shooting, say a car driving by for a car chase, had the camera on the side of the road, low angle, getting the tires and the leaves as they blow by the camera, right? Car kicks up a stone off of the asphalt and it lands smack dab, hits the front of the lens, right? If I got an op optical flat in place, uh, this is gonna protect that cinema lens from being damaged. If I don't have this in place and that stone kicks up and into the map box, it's probably gonna crack or break the front element of my cinema lens. And now I've got an expensive repair or an expensive replacement of a lens instead of a clear filter. Okay, so optical flats, good idea. It's one of Ira's five highly recommended filters, uh, even in the digital age. So that's a cut glass optical flat. Has no color value or bias to it at all. It's just a clear protective filter that uh, protects the lens from physically being damaged. Okay, but a four by four matte box usually has two filter stages and those are uh, two slots behind the, the front extrusion. Okay, this is the front extrusion or cowling. You got two filter trays back there, they slot in like so. And that just holds the, the filter in the matte box and then you can lock them in place with these two lockdown screws. And the nice thing about these matte boxes is the uh, the backstage will rotate. So I can rotate the second filter in the back of the matte box if I have, for instance, a filter effect that I need to do like polarization. And I'll show you why you wanna do that with a polarizer in a few minutes. But this is a matte box. There's lots of different types. This one is designed to mount to the rods of your rod base and screw onto the front of your lens so that between the rods and the lens, you're holding this thing securely onto the camera in a way that it's not gonna, it's not gonna come off and it's gonna protect the overall system uh, from uh, being damaged if you grab the camera in the wrong way when you're going from say the tripod to the dolly, if you grab the front of the matte box out of some sort of automatic response and yank that camera off the tripod you know, if it's a if it's a matte box that's designed to just float in front of your lens and you grab it, it has very little support. You could rip the matte box right off the front of the camera. And I like to avoid problems like that. So I like matte boxes that integrate in a couple of different ways to my camera system, both the rods and the front of the lens. OK, you guys have this style of matte box at UCF. You've also got the Red Rock Swing Away, which is this guy here, which is designed to float in front of your cinema lens, but it can swing away and reveal the lens port on your camera so that when you wanna do a lens change really quickly, 
instead of having to undo all of the threaded rings and stuff, you just swing the matte box away from the front of the camera, pull your lens out, put your new one in place and swing the matte box back. But if you grab this matte box in your haste and frustration on the set and try to go from a tripod to a dolly and yank on that swing away matte box, you might very well rip it right off the rods. Okay, which would be embarrassing and expensive because it'll be a repair. So a couple of different ways for your matte box to mount to your camera and hold your filters and just make sure that uh, whichever one you pick, you understand what its frailties are and deal with it accordingly. With this one, it's these rings. They fall out really easily. They don't mount in, they don't screw in. They just sort of drop in and then, you know, grab the front of your lens and your rods it's not as secure as the Schneider matte box, but it's the next best thing. Uh, and this happens to be the, the, the weak link of this system, right? But this matte box is important because if I'm using um, four by 5.65 filters for some reason, this uh, matte box has a four by 5.65 filter tray. And you can see it's a little bit more rectangular than a four by four tray. So here's a four by four tray and here's a four by 5.65 tray. I don't know if you can see the difference there, but one's a little bit more rectangular than the other. This one will handle um, certain anamorphic lenses, small anamorphic lenses, like a Serio 35 anamorphic, for instance, or a Serio 50 millimeter anamorphic on a GH5. With that map box, you could use four by 5.65 filters to cover your anamorphic lenses, or you can go four by four if you're just shooting digital, uh, digital files with uh, standard spherical uh, film lenses, right? Now, it just so happens that I have this matte box, not just for the sake of demonstration, but I have a whole series of unique diffusion filters, handmade diffusion filters, that are in 5.4 by 5.65 Panavision size, right? So I needed a matte box that would allow me to use those filters. So if I'm using my custom handmade diffusion filters, um, I'm gonna use this uh, matte box from Canada, the Cinevate matte box, because it has the wider filter tray holder, okay? So that's, that's something that you do simply out of, you know, logistical and mechanical necessity. It doesn't make this map box better than the Schneider map box, but in the case of four by five, six, five, if that's the filter I need to use, I can't use this map box. I have to use this one. So I'll pull this map box off the camera and put this map box on the camera. The nice thing about this map box also is the rod adjustment is, or the rod bracket is adjustable, right? So the lens height, you know, versus the rod height on some of the cameras is different. It shouldn't be, but it's different. And so if I have a problem with this thing marrying to the rods and the front of my lens, for some reason, I can adjust the height of the rod bracket accordingly and ensure that this matte box will fit no matter what, you know, camera and lens system I'm, I'm using. Okay, so that's kind of a neat aspect of this matte box as well. You can see on the on the Schneider map box, the rod adapter does not adjust its height. That's it. It's just mounted on there and that's it. All right. So it's it's a little bit problematic. Certain cameras and rod bases are problematic for this map box as a result of that. Okay. So the cut glass filters come in a bunch of different flavors. And I've got a stack of them here to talk to you about. <clears throat> so the first one I'll show you, I, I showed you the optical flat, okay. Um, the next one that we can talk about is, uh, well, let's talk about the Jerry Bruckheimer filter. So Ira Tiffin was talking about the coral grad filter. Um, and this should be a coral grad right here, if I'm not mistaken. So this is a coral grad number three. So it is a, a medium effect. The coral grads go up to six, I think. Um, 
so here's a coral grad number three. It's somewhere in the middle. And you can see from my little white card here what that looks like. So do you see how the bottom of the filter down here is clear? And the top of the filter by my index finger starts showing you a gradual increase of coral color from the top towards the middle of the filter. You see that? So this is what we call a grad filter, right? It's graduated from one side of the filter towards the other from the densest part of color to no color at all. All right, you can apply that to the side, you can apply it to the bottom, or you can apply it to the top. And in the case of, in the case of fighter jets flying off the deck of the Nimitz or whatever that was, I think it was the Nimitz, um, Jeffrey Kimball added the coral filter just to give a more dramatic impact to the uh, to the sky at dawn, right? So the idea was all these fighter planes are launching from the, the decks of the Nimitz on a reconnaissance mission, and it's it, the sun is just coming up over the horizon. Well, if you get up really early in the morning and you look at sunsets, you'll understand that a lot of times in the morning, you can get some very dramatic looking sunrises as the sun's just peeking up over the horizon uh early early in the morning like that the sun's natural color is very orange and very vibrant and so the way kimball felt when he was shooting those fighter planes was he really wanted to feel that it's dawn it's the, it's the, it's the start of a new day and the and that the full power and might of the US Navy is alive and working already to, to secure your freedom somewhere in the Indian Ocean, right, was the, was the one third. Uh, and that whole idea was, ah, you know, so it's, it's dawn. What color is dawn? It's orange. It's on fire. You know, the sun comes over the horizon. So he used all that inspiration in the way he felt. And he said, I'm going to apply a coral grad filter to this situation and enhance the effect so that what I, what I get from the in-camera rendering is some reflection of my mind's eye, how I felt at the time. It, it's, a, it's an emotional choice, the color grad filter. Because in this case, um, a lot of times there's a difference between what we, what we record as a photographer and how we want our audience to feel. We can make a simple rendering of an image as we saw it in that moment, or as Ansel Adams so uh, eloquently states, the, the photographs we take are a reflection of our emotional state when we saw that thing in front of us and we were affected by its beauty or by its awesome presence. And so the image we take of that scene is not what we saw with our eyes, but what we saw with our, our heart, right? And so Jeffrey Kimball's heart saw a much more intense color saturation than he might've actually had to work with. So he added the filter and he did it in camera instead of trying to do it later. And of course, Top Gun was, what, 1985? Uh, we didn't have digital filters in 1985. So if he wanted it, he had to do it in camera. So that's a coral grad. Now let's say, let's say you're at the beach and you wanna photograph uh, somebody frolicking around in the water for Sports Illustrated, let's say, a, a bathing suit shot or something. Um, and you get there and the sky is just not happening, right? The water looks nice since, you know, the overcast sky makes water look really, really nice. But the hard sun is what gives us our nice looking backlight, our spectral highlights and all that. And the hard sun means there's no clouds in the sky, which means we get our dense blue skies. When it's overcast, we don't get blue skies. So what you might opt to do at that point is add what's called, this one's called uh, um, paradise blue. And it is a single density. So it's a very light effect. And if I show you in front of the white card, you can see how it's a very subtle blue gradual filter, right? And when you're trying to enhance the color of your blue sky, you don't want to go too far in one direction with a filter because then you have to dial out what's too much in post. But if you start with a little bit like this, and then finish it in post, you can put blue sky in your image where there wasn't 
blue sky before. And this is one way of doing it. You can do it other ways, obviously. But if you're talking about st standard color correction practices, standard camera operating practices, you might select a paradise blue grad, start the effect in camera, and then give a note to the editor, send this clip to the colorist to enhance the blue in the sky. I added a paradise blue number one for this shot and all the coverage of this scene. And uh, they'll go into post and they'll affect the color correction based on your instructions. So that's a blue grad. You know, the blue grad is interesting because not only can you affect the skies with it, but let's say like I was shooting in Titusville uh, one weekend and I was shooting a shot uh, across the bay and the water just didn't, it wasn't, it was looking kind of brown and muddy. You could take your paradise blue grad, turn it upside down so that the blue effect is on the bottom and add a little blue color to the water. Uh, let's say the sky is fine and you're looking the sun is behind you, and so the sky is nice and densely blue. You don't need any help up in the sky, but the water itself is looking kind of green and a little bit gnarly. You can add a blue uh, grad to the bottom of the frame, if, if that's the case, and, and add the color uh, where you need it. So the grads can be pretty flexible, and, and they can be a nice tool. They're not really expensive. Um, cut glass filters are expensive by design, you know, because they require a matte box and they're made exclusively by professional uh, filter dealers. So a Paradise Blue Grad from, this one's from Schneider, probably costs, you know, 250, 300 bucks. Okay, but it's four by four and you can use it, you know, for a lot of different lenses. And when it's part of a whole stack of filters that you have available to rent to production, it becomes an added source of income for a DP. So it's a good idea if you want to own your filters, just go ahead. If it's a filter you like and you're going to use it a lot, uh, buy it and rent it. And you know, you, it might only take you three or four times renting it to production companies before you make your money back. And then you own the filter essentially for free. So it's a good deal. Uh, okay, so those are uh, colored grads. Um, another type of filter that Ira was talking about was um, uh, neutral density filter. So, oh, here, before I show you neutral density, I'll show you a full color tone. This is, uh, oh no, this is a chocolate grad. It's another grad filter, but this one is chocolate in color. So again, you know, it's a, it's an effect you can use, uh, on your scene. This color up here is the color of, you know, Hershey's chocolate. And uh, it can be just the right color uh, if you're shooting, let's say, uh, a period film, right? And you want to add a little bit of color bias to the overall image to give it that sort of toned antique look. Uh, chocolate filter is handy for that. You can get it in a full chocolate uh, correction for the filter or graduate, uh, like I just showed you. Okay, so now neutral density filters. So. Someone was asking, what is a neutral density filter? A neutral density filter is like sunglasses for the camera or sunglasses for the lens, if you will. So you go to the beach, you show up, you get out of the car, you're walking across the sand and poof, you're blinded. The sun is out, it's, it's hard and full and, and it's bouncing off the sand and there's a lot of glare and reflection everywhere. The first thing you're gonna do is pop on your sunglasses, right? Well, you can do the same thing to your camera. And here is a neutral density filter. Neutral density, it just means no effect, just gray. It's adding neutral gray value to the overall image, darkening the image slightly, right? So in this case, you can see this neutral density has a certain value, okay? This is a neutral density uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.6 ND, okay? And you're gonna learn on Wednesday what that means. It's basically a way to help you control the lightness or darkness of your images outside of any controls you have on the camera. So you remember how Ira was talking about how filters should be sort of the second wave of creative impulse? The first, your first uh, 
treatment of your images, the first way that you affect your images is by choosing the lenses and the cameras and adjusting the camera controls accordingly to get well-balanced images that aren't too bright and aren't too dark. But you can take a camera to the beach, for instance, and if there's a lot of sun, you can adjust the lens as far as you can and adjust the camera as far as you can and still have images that are looking too bright on your LCD screen or in your viewfinder or on your external monitor. And when that's the case, when you've exhausted all the control that the camera has to offer or that the lens has to offer and your images are still too bright, that's when you wanna start incorporating neutral density filters into your solution and they help darken the image in calibrated amounts right until you get the right amount of density or brightness to the image uh, depending on which filter you drop in and that's when you shoot okay so there are different ways to do neutral density this is a 0.6 right so this is like a double density uh, filter if you if you could think of it that way single density would be 0 0.3 double density 0 0.6 triple density would be 0 0.9 and so forth da -da 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 -da, on and down the line Okay, each time you add a layer of density to the filter, you are making the image incrementally darker, darker, darker by 50%, let's say 100%, not 100%, that would mean it was black, but taking away half the light each time you add a neutral density filter in front of the lens so that you can help the camera manage the overall brightness of the image once you've exhausted all the camera controls and all the lens controls. Neutral density is a really important filter. Uh, polarizer is another filter that Ira talked about. And the polarizer does a couple of different things. Um, the polarizer can uh, remove reflections from a scene. So let's say you're shooting a scene in a stream and it's a it's a guy fly fishing, right? And it's a commercial for, I don't know, insurance or something, right? You know, save for your old age and, you know, so you can go fishing when you're 90, whatever. Uh, and you're out there and you got the camera on the tripod and you're in the water, kind of shooting across the water at the guy fly fishing. And there's a lot of glare on the surface of the water. The angle of the sun is just right. And it's giving you a lot of glare off the water. Well, a polarizer can help you control the amount of or the intensity of reflections, and in many cases, reduce the reflections uh, off of things like glass and water. So anybody here use polarized sunglasses? I have. Okay, so what do you experience when you put polarized sunglasses on? Pretty much just what you said that you don't have as much reflection in your eyes and specifically like if you're going out on a boat on a really sunny day it really helps. Driving a boat, surfing, driving in a car, riding a motorcycle, anywhere where you want to keep those really hard reflections from hitting you in the eye and, and distracting you from your responsibility of controlling that device, right? Um, but the camera can get hit by, you know, spectral highlights as well. It can flare the lens. Uh, it can look, you know, aesthetically unpleasing in the camera, or it can be just too much. Maybe a little bit's okay, but a lot is too much. And so you want to control the intensity. And you do that by turning the polarizing filter. So do you ever notice when you put your polarizing sunglasses on, if you start bobbing your head one way or the other, you can see the sky get darker blue or lighter blue, and you can see reflections in the storefront windows come on and come off based on how you cock your head, right? Yeah, I've so noticed that. The polarizing filter works the same way. That's why that rear stage in the map box has to be able to turn so that you can turn the filter. And when you turn the filter, you'll see the effect come on and come off depending on the sun angle, right? So you point the camera one way and you get these 
horrible reflections in the storefront window. You're shooting the mannequins, let's say, and you got a scene two lovebirds are window shopping. They're walking down the street. They stop and they look at the beautiful red dress in the window. But when you sit there and try to shoot it, all you get is reflections of the storefronts across the street behind you. And you want to get rid of that. So you put a polarizer on the camera and you turn it until the reflections in the store window go away. And all you see is the beautiful red dress on the mannequin in the window and the two lovers on the sidewalk talking about how they're going to go in and buy the dress. And the reflections that you saw before have been eliminated with the polarizer, right? So that's one use. If you're shooting car shots and you want to shoot the people through the front of the car, through the windshield, at the driver and the passenger seat on a two shot of people driving down the road, you get reflections in the windshield really badly, especially day exterior. You can take your polarizer, turn it, and all of a sudden, all the reflections in the windshield disappear and you're looking right through the windshield at the driver and the passenger, right? So those are the practical aspects of a polarizer. The other thing a polarizer does by default, all it's doing is, is it's, it's, rectifying angles of light that are going through the lens at stray angles and creating what we call by definition diffusion, right? And it's restoring all of those vectors to straight lines. So they go right through the lens and they don't cause undue reflection inside, which causes flaring and all and veiling uh, fog and stuff like that. The polarizer is eliminating those effects. And in the process of doing that, what it'll also do is make colors look more saturated. So the other uh, practical use of a polarizer is if you go outside and it's a sunny day and it's a clear sky, but you're not getting that beautiful saturated blue that your, your heart wants to see in the image. You can take that, put that polarizer on and immediately the sky gets really densely blue and anything in the frame that has color, like a red dress, let's say. So the, the, the couple leaves the dress shop and now she's wearing the red dress. They saw it in the window. They went in, they bought it. She put it on. Now they're walking down the street with the red dress and you want to shoot them walking away. Uh, and you look at the scene just under the natural sunlight and you're like, yeah, it's okay. You put the polarizer on and all of a sudden the sky gets really blue and that red dress just pops, right? Polarizer, right? So the polarizer will saturate color and it will remove reflections and glare from shiny surfaces like water, metal, glass, okay? Polarizer is very handy. It's also one of Ira's top five uh, necessary filters. And then uh, I also want to talk to you about the white promist, which is a diffusion filter. So the other thing that Ira talked about was, um, and the example given was War of the Worlds, right? And we saw footage of War of the Worlds where the uh, they, they find the body uh, or they go to the location where the body was found uh, near the pond and the cattails are waving in the breeze and the sun is dappling off the water and it's got little starry highlights around it. And there was an exterior night shot where all the street lights had sort of veiled halos around them, right? That was done with what's called a white promist filter, which is a diffusion filter. And it kind of just looks clear, doesn't it? But what this does is it takes detail and just softens it up. It lowers the contrast, softens up fine detail in the image. And I'm going to see if there's a way for me to show you what this does. I might be able to show you with the lens cap here. You got a Lumix lens cap. And if I put the diffusion in front of it, well, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see a little bit of the, the veiled highlight happening on the silver lettering. Um, it makes detail soft, right? I don't know if you can see it in my face, maybe in my beard. It just takes some of the hard edge off of details in your image, makes them a little bit softer. It takes the light and just sort of spreads it around a little bit, okay? But it can be a very handy filter to use. And I don't know if you can see the effect. It, it almost looks like... Um, a very fine layer of mist was applied to the glass and it just kind of dried there, or it looks a little bit like um, overspray from a paint can, you know? In fact, um, the handmade diffusion filters that I have, uh, the effect was applied in a similar manner. The, 
the diffusion material that was used, whatever that material was, was um, reduced to aerosol in a container, uh, imbued in the air in the container, and then the filter was passed through it and whatever collected on the surface of the glass and dried was the diffusion effect. And then that would get covered with an outer protective layer of uh, resin. And you ended up with a diffusion filter that was applied through the aerosol application of a diffusion element like, um, I don't know what they use, maybe, maybe chalk dust or something, whatever it was, finally distributed and, and applied to the surface of the glass. And it gives you the same diffusion effect. This is called white pearl mist, and it will take highlights and make them bloom and veil and give you little halos around stuff. Neat filter. Uh, what else? Cosmetic commercials will use diffusion filters. Um, so you got a close up of Julianne Moore, for instance, and she says, you know, uh, my makeup is by whatever Revlon or Miss Clairol or, or whatever, you know. And, uh, and she says, um, but I'm worth it, right? And so you got her close up filling your television screen and she's very beautiful and she's, she's in focus, but for some reason, her skin has a, a smooth glow to it. And you don't see the pores or any age lines. Uh, a diffusion filter will cosmetically work uh, together with the camera to clean up and smooth out a really tight close up. And so if you're doing it, whether it's for a feature film or a television commercial, Revlon commercial, uh, the diffusion filters in many cases have been a secret ingredient that many cinematographers have used over the generations uh, as a kind of a trade secret and a way of setting their work apart from other cinematographers is the type of diffusions that they use on their leading ladies uh, for features or commercials. And those secrets were kept very tightly um, because once you found out the kind of diffusion somebody was using, then everybody's out buying that filter and they're trying to use it as well. And it loses its, its novelty, right? So a lot of cinematographers uh, wouldn't even tell their assistants what kind of diffusion they were using. You just hand the assistant, you know, a, um, you know a, an unlabeled filter, put this in the map box for me. And then you'd drop it in and, and you'd shoot with it. And then, you know, the DP would let you know when he wants to pull it and put it away. And you ask him, what, what filter is that? He'll say, you know, maybe, maybe in 10 years when you're ready to move up to operator, I'll tell you what that filter was, right? They just wouldn't tell you because back in those days, that was something that made them, it was added value. If it was a secret that only they knew that they had figured out somehow. Um, and so diffusion was really... Uh, a key to a lot of creativity. And the actresses, you know, especially big name actresses, they would, they might even have their own preference for diffusion filters like Elizabeth Taylor or, you know, a high profile actress like that who, you know, makes a lot of money acting and has, uh, you know, a, a brand, a brand manager who is very careful to protect uh, the images of Elizabeth Taylor and how she's presented in the media. And therefore you have that, that agent is on set when photographing is taking place. And she might walk up to the cinematographer and say, listen, you know, if you're going to shoot a close up of Liz in this scene, you better be using XYZ diffusion filter. That's what we insist. It's written into her contract. If you don't use it, you know, you can't use that shot for the movie. You got to make sure that contractually, you shoot her close up, you're gonna use this filter, right? And that was a real thing once upon a time. I don't know if actresses are still doing that, um, but diffusion, you know, there's maybe 30, 40, maybe 50 different kinds of diffusion out there. Every manufacturer is gonna have their version of the effect and they might call it similar or dissimilar names, um, but there are many, many, many different grades of diffusion filter. They all do slightly different things and it's all an aesthetic choice. So you can't say one is better than the other, um, but certainly they all will render a certain kind of result. And therefore the one you pick is gonna be based on your personal preference and 
the way the effect is going to work for whatever you're shooting and you make a decision, you qualify that and maybe camera tests in the beginning of a movie, for instance, uh, we will get together for a couple of days or a week before principal photography starts and we'll get our hero actors on the stage. Uh, we'll get some lighting set up. We'll have the makeup and hair people and the wardrobe people come in and make up and dress up the, the actresses, look at them on camera, shoot a little bit of footage under slightly different variations of lighting, slightly different variations of makeup, slightly different variations of hairstyle, differences in wardrobe, like pure white chemise, off-white chemise, tea-dyed chemise, um, you know, linen chemise, which white shirt looks best, right? And you do camera tests to figure that out. Well, you do the same thing with diffusion tests. Diffusion on the light sources, diffusion on the lens, which type of diffusion flatters the actress the best, uh, in what kind of lighting situation, and we'll sort all that out in pre-production doing camera tests. And those are huge, huge importance to large feature films. I remember we did camera tests, like for instance, for uh, for Too Fast and Furious, uh, the camera tests were, they lasted a whole week. And we did tests for uh, a couple of uh, different female drivers and we did camera tests uh, for uh, a couple of the male drivers. Uh, and we just looked at, uh, for instance, you know, what kind of lighting do we want to look at um, Anna under, you know? What kind of lighting should we have when, uh, when Paul is driving or when Paul is having dinner with, uh, with Anne? You know, how do we want that to look, right? Um, stuff like that. So we would do tests and we would take a look at it. You know, turned out that Paul Walker didn't need any diffusion on the lights or on the lens, um, but you might want to take your supporting lead or your your lead female roles and give them a little bit of diffusion to help with you know when you're shooting in hard miami sun outside in a close-up um you're going to really see the pores in someone's skin and and that's not a very flattering thing to see in a big close-up right so you put a diffusion filter on there and all that subtle unwanted detail kind of melts into the backdrop and you end up with this very nice sort of creamy uh, glowy looking skin quality. And that's super flattering in outdoor daylight in Miami. So it ends up looking really good on your, on your, on your actors and actresses as a result of that. Okay. Um, so would, would you say that the um, reason that uh, Michael Bay's films have that certain look to them, um, even if you don't know it's a Michael Bay film, even without even looking at the action, it has a certain, quality to the image itself that maybe is kind of anti-diffusion in a way because it, it it likes to capture a lot of the sharpness and 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 pores and stuff and makes it really kind of dirty i'll say this having done two movies with mike <laughs> you definitely know it's a michael bay film whether you're watching it or working on it it definitely feels different from anything else you'll ever do um, and so when we did day exteriors on bad boys two, for instance, um, man, we would add hard lighting to shots where we didn't need extra lighting. There's plenty of light in downtown Miami during the day, especially, I mean, we were down there from, I don't know. I think we started that movie in late July and we shot till like September, October. And, uh, there's plenty of light in Miami during the day and during those months, right? But he likes those crispy edges and all of that spectral highlight and stuff that hard light reflections will add. So no polarizers, no diffusion, right? On the lights or the lenses and, you know, hard light on the actors so that they get, you know, reflections in Will's uh, skin and makeup, reflections in, uh, in, um, um, um his sidekick there um martin right in martin's face reflections hard light it turns out people of color look very good with hard direct light sources because the light sources will reflect in the skin and reflect back to the camera now you can eliminate those reflections or you can keep them and sometimes it's better to light people of color with 
lights that cause reflections in the flesh because otherwise the light goes into darker objects and doesn't show you detail, right? So a, a person of color who's backlit during Miami daylight, Miami sun during the day might turn silhouette to camera if the sun is behind them. And the only way to get light on them is to just crush them from the front with something very big and bright and powerful that will reflect back to camera in such a way that it fills up the detail of the faces walking towards you when the sun is behind them and maintains the crispy edges that Mike likes and stuff. Lighting for Michael Bay was was a lot of work and it was it was very challenging and a lot and there was a couple of times when he asked me to do stuff that I was just like I don't think that's right and I turned to the DP and I'm like I don't want to do that and and Mitch would be like just do it he knows what he's doing you know and you do it and you feel uneasy about it and then you go to the dailies or you see it in the premiere and go I'll be damned if he wasn't exactly right he knew exactly what that needed to be and it fits his look perfectly so okay. That's a unique situation. Michael Bay is a unique situation that, you know, a lot of times he'll ask you to do things that other cinematographers or other directors would never ask you to do because he's got it dialed in. He knows exactly what he's right. doing. So, so that's where the knowledge comes in is you have to know the equipment you're working with, what you're trying to achieve with it, or else you can try and be Michael Bay. But if you don't know why he's doing it, then trying to mimic that is not really going to work out because it's like, yeah, you can shoot the same shot, but if you're not shooting it for the same reason, you know, it works in his films because it has a purpose. It, you know, and if you're going to shoot something, you got to make sure you're doing it to fit what you need. You can get pretty close, right? Right. But there'll be times when Michael asks you to do something and he'd be like, that's crazy, you know, and he'll say, do it anyway, you know, and it's because everything within me that's traditional that is the result of having you know many many different mentors showing me craft and how to do my job right and it conflicts with what he wants and you go no your your instinct is to reject it no that's too much and he'll say do it anyway and then you do it and he pushes you outside of your comfort zone and then when you look at it you go yeah that's that's his look so you, you get a sense of where his look comes from by knowing where the, the, the boundaries were between traditional problem solving and Michael Bay problem solving, right? It's one step past what you would normally choose to do or say was sensible or reasonable and then go one step more and that's Mike's look, <laughs> right? And you can mimic that in a lot of ways, but there's times when he'll rein that in you know, and, and it's really emotion, emotional choices. And, and that fits nicely into our conversation about filters because filters can be very emotional choices, right? Either the filmmakers feeling a, a euphoric sense about what they're shooting and they're trying to in, imbibe that into the image or the filmmaker wants the audience to feel that emotion when they're watching the image and they're doing it maybe for that reason or for both reasons. Um, and so filters, I think, are more of an emotional choice. That's why Ira called them kind of a secondary image crafting solution, because the first, the first order of solutions should always be, you know, correct exposure and getting everything to a nice color balance, a nice exposure balance, so that it's not too bright, not too dark. Colors don't look unnatural. They look accurate. And once you get the image to that point, then you start asking yourself the question of, now, should I add a filter for a specific effect? And to what extent do I want that effect? And then you pick the appropriate filter for that solution. Okay, so that's what this conversation is all about. It's about now taking your images to the next level with a very simple product or a very simple uh, corrective solution that gives your image just that little something extra, right? So that's cut glass filters. Pretty much anything you can find in a threaded round filter or a drop-in or a ratten filter or a coken filter, you can find in a glass drop-in filter. In fact, because these are considered professional filters, there might be even more solutions in cut glass than there are in any, in any other style of filter. Um, whatever the case may be, 
Um, there's plenty of variety to choose from. There's, there's uh, differences in sizes, differences in brand, differences in effect. Um, and it's really kind of an interesting world to dip your toe into. Um, there's a lot of choice, like Iris said, it can be very overwhelming the number of choices you have in filters. So you start with a couple and you get comfortable with it and you see how they, they help you. And then you start a little bit at a time branching out and trying more and more and trying different grades and different effects and, and find what you like and, and start building a little sort of a little stable of preferred filters have a couple of different diffusions that you like to use. Uh, definitely in the digital age, you definitely want to have neutral density filters because the sensors are so, uh, the image devices are so sensitive um, that you need sunglasses more often than not just to control the brightness of your image with a digital camera. Film cameras were a lot less sensitive than digital cameras in that respect. And so there's even more neutral density filters available for digital cinema cameras than there were for film cameras. But you definitely want them. Polarizer, definitely want to have it. You know, the clear glass filter or the optical flat, we call it, uh, is another just, it's a mainstay. You should have it in your kit. Anytime you do stunts or, you know, explosions or whatever, you should be putting that optical flat in front of the camera, right? Um, here's some uh, neutral density filters. These are the... Uh, Panavision uh, neutral density uh, filters for digital. So they go all the way from single density, double density, triple density, quadruple density. They go all the way up to, so double, triple, quad, five times, six times, seven times density, right? In the Panavision digital HD filters. So this is a complete set of four by 5.65 Panavision uh, ND filters, right? And here's, uh, here's a six by six filter. So you can see the four by four, I can kind of palm it with one hand, but the six by six, you got to grab it by opposing corners because it's, it's a really big piece of glass. These are, uh, I don't know, maybe three sixteenths of an inch thick. So it's a, it's a nice robust piece of glass, but still, you know, and in six by six, it's going to be a little heavy too. So, you know, that's a six by six filter. That's a six by six single density neutral density filter he's holding in front of his eye right there. And then here's a Crozeal matte box mounted to the front of an Ursa Mini 4.6K. I prefer the, the Schneider boxes. Um, I, you know, I recommended these to UCF. UCF uh, uh, took that advice and got you guys about eight or 10 of these. Um, which I, I think are nice and flexible because they have those added little sort of eyebrows that you can dial in and reduce the overall size of the hole that the light is passing through. I don't know if you can see those louvers that I just turned, but uh, you can see how they, they flip up from the bottom and down from the top. And you can, you know, it's, it's kind of like being able to adjust the visor on your baseball cap. If you could tilt the visor on your baseball cap, it's doing basically the same thing. And in some cases, all you need to do is adjust these inside uh, louvers and you don't have to add the extra big eyebrow off the front of the camera, which then becomes a, an eye poking hazard uh, when you're running around the set with a matte box on the lens. But here's a Crozeal. This is just another brand of matte box. Um, good matte boxes, um, but like I said, I prefer these for the way they mount in this added internal flap that they have. So this is, uh, oh, it's, I made a little video. So this is just dropping the, le the, the filters into the, into the Schneider matte box. Let's um, see what this is looking like. Go ahead, there's no sound here. Oh, okay. Um, I just had a quick question. You mentioned um, the, like like the the eyepiece right running around that might be a little cumbersome um doing the the handheld uh I, i've actually been thinking about this for a while how exactly does the first ac perform his focus pulls during a steady cam or, or a you know a handheld like you know running shot or or something like that like when it's somebody else running there does he run with them is it on a remote i mean how how does he keep that with in in time with that uh 
<laughs> the first AC usually ends up running alongside the camera for a, really for a simple, a couple of simple reasons. Number one, um, you have to put yourself in a position where you can estimate the distances from the lens to the action, right? And it's very hard from behind the camera to guess what the distance is from the little optical uh, image plane marking on the camera, which is back here on the Ursa Mini. You know, if you're behind the camera trying to figure out the distance from this point to your actor standing, you know, X number of feet downrange in front of the camera, directly behind the camera is not the place to try and figure that out. You want to get yourself around sort of 90 degrees to the action so you can see the lens and see the character, and then you can see the distance and estimate it in between. And, and then dial that into a remote focus assist, a radio controlled focus assist, right? The other reason why you might wanna run along with the camera is some of those focus assists were only good for a certain number of feet and it was line of sight. So if you had to you know, run away from something on set towards something and maybe go around a corner, uh, if you stayed by the director's monitor and tried to focus by looking at the image on the director's monitor, the minute the camera ducked around a corner and ran away from your field of view, you might lose radio contact with the lens and you would lose control of the camera as a result of that. So you would want to run along with the camera just to make sure that you stayed within range of the radio transmitter and receiver for the follow focus because it's radio controlled, right? And that would be the other reason you'd want to run along with the camera. And the third reason would be, especially if it's a handheld shot that you're doing, not necessarily a steady cam, but if it's a handheld shot, at the end of that shot, wherever the operator stops and cuts the camera, he wants to let go of that thing. And you had better be there to catch it when he does that, or that camera's going to hit the deck. And I've seen it happen before as a second AC. It's a very sickening feeling when you see a $100,000 camera hit the deck because the assistant didn't realize the operator was just going to let go at the end of the shot, right? And, you know, it's something that happens. And so that's the other reason why you don't want to venture too far away from your responsibility, because if you're all standing 50 feet away at the director's monitor and the operator stops and does that, and let's go to the camera, <laughs> bang. So basically, when, you're, when you arrive on set, you're the first AC, you go say hi to the camera operator that day, and you don't leave him alone the entire shoot. <laughs> he is now your friend. Once you, the camera's you stay on with the that set, guy. once the camera's on the set, the first AC wants to stick to that thing like glue. You don't want to walk right. away from it because it's your responsibility, nobody else's, you know? So you got to be there to, you know, take it off the dolly and move it to the sticks. You got to be there to take it off the mag liner and put it on the steady cam to start your day. You got to get it off the steady cam. You got to put it away. You got to pull it out of the box in the morning and get it built. You know, once it's on set and ready to work, the first AC has a tendency to not leave that the side of the camera, right? That's why you need a second AC, somebody who can, you know, work on the next ring of activity around the camera. So the camera is the bullseye, right? If you think about it like a dartboard, the camera's at the bullseye, and then you have your inside ring, and then you have your outside ring, and then you've got your out of bounds, right? And so the first AC is in the inner bull ring. The second AC is one layer out, you know, back and forth to the mag liner for widgets and accessories, back to the camera to find out if the first AC needs something, and then out in front of the lens to do the slating, right? And then the loader is in the third ring on the outside, right? hanging back by the mag liner, bringing magazines in from the camera truck that are loaded with fresh film or bringing in freshly formatted data cards and getting ready to assist when the camera needs to reload. And so you got people stationed at each segment of the dartboard, right? From the bullseye on out. And the first AC doesn't leave the center of that ring for most of the day. The only time they leave the camera is to go to the bathroom and go to lunch, right? And, and beyond that, you know, if it's your job, you need to be there for whatever needs to happen to that camera, okay? Um, that's the job. So if you're not ready to take on that amount of responsibility, then don't ask for the first AC job. Some camera assistants like being second ACs and they stay second AC their whole lives. Some, you know, 
pretty much every camera assistant starts as a loader, works into the department, works their way up, and then they stop at whatever level of responsibility they're willing to take on. Uh, and that's where they spend their career, right? Operator is usually selected from the crop of first ACs that want to move up. They don't want to stay focus pullers forever. They might be okay at it, but they're not the best because if you're the best focus puller, you'll never be anything but a focus puller. Why? Because Hollywood is insecure. And once you find somebody that can do that job, which is a very difficult job, if you can do it and do it well to the point where you are never off, you never miss, you're going to be sought after as much as a good DP, a good focus puller is going to be, is going to demand premium market value because it's a really, really hard job. And some people just can't do it, right? No matter how much you want to have that job, if you have no talent for focusing remotely without having to look through the viewfinder or look at a monitor, um, you're just not cut out for that position. And, and that's okay because there might be something else that you're, you're good at. Like I said, most of the operators in Hollywood are operators because they weren't good focus pullers. So they were allowed to do the job long enough to learn how to operate and then they move up to operator. And then they might be a brilliant camera operator but have absolutely no touch at the focus wheel. And that's okay because it takes all kinds to make a village or to make a movie. You need a focus puller, you need an operator, you need a second AC and they're not all the same person. Okay, so that's a little bit about life in the camera department. It's a little far afield from filters, but that's basically what's going on. Um, I gave you a little Matt box video from Wolf Crow to watch. He compares, I think, four or five different brands and styles of Matt box. Um, so this is the um, the the uh, Century Matt box. This was the Crozeal Matt box. This is a, a Red Rock Micro Swing Away map box. This is a Red Rock Swing Away right here. It's kind of hard to see in this dark, dark room, but there's a Red Rock Swing Away behind me. This is what it looks like. Uh, mounts to the rods and it has this little knob right here. You pull it up and the whole front of the map box will swing open and give you access to do quick lens changes, right? This is the way a Panavision map box works, by the way, uh, just like the Red Rock uh, Swing Away, so. If you want to emulate the feel of working with a Panaflex, then you're probably going to select a Red Rock, a Red Rock Swing Away map box. And then here's what we call a clip-on map box. So Bright Tangerine makes map boxes like this. Crozeal has clip-on map boxes. Format makes clip-on map boxes. And they basically work a little bit like the Coke and filter. You, you thread a, a, an adapter ring on the lens, and then the map box will clip over that adapter ring and mount right to the front of the lens. Okay, and for a cinema lens, that's not a problem. If you end up using a like a Canon photo lens and adapting it for a cinema camera, you got to make sure that when you focus that lens, the lens doesn't move and it doesn't turn. A lot of times with a photographic lens, the front element grouping will move in and out from the barrel and it will rotate as you focus the lens. And if that's happening, then a clip-on map box is gonna turn with the lens when it focuses and then that, that's gonna be a problem for you, okay? So clip-on map boxes are really only designed to work with cinema lenses or lenses that focus internally and not helical rotationally, okay? So that's a clip-on map box. All right, so styles, flavors of filters. So you got your color correction, right? And they come in a whole variety, right? Um, you have some that are blue, some that are look blue and they correct indoor light to outdoor light. You got some that look pink and they might be strictly pink or they might be CC pink, color corrective pink, meaning they filter out the green spike from fluorescent lighting uh, at the mall or at the bank if you're shooting in a commercial space in an office space right a fluorescent filter is also a corrective filter or just straight up pink or orange or green some of these uh, like green and orange filters uh, were used um, and blue filters uh, were used in the days when we shot black and white film because they helped affect changes in the contrast of black and white film like if you wanted clouds to be really prominent, puffy white against a really dense looking sky, you'd use a red filter because red is the opposite of blue. 
And when you put a red filter in front of a lens that's shooting black and white film, the blue sky will get really dark and dense and almost look black in some cases. So you've seen, you guys familiar with Ansel Adams and his photography of the American West? You see those beautiful shots of Half Dome Mountain at Yosemite and the sky mm. it looks black. Love Ansel Adams' work. I had a <laughs> photography class. They were like, I mean, it's research a whole bunch and I had to go through a list of them. And when I saw Ansel's, I'm like, oh, this guy's definitely one I want to keep track of because he, the way, the way he's just got it, it's so, very so good. Very majestic, very emotional photography. So in, in Ansel's day, I don't know if they had polarizers. He used a red filter to get those skies to look black and dense like that black and white film. So you don't see the redness of the filter itself. What you see is the corrective effect of red filtration against blue colored subject. And the result is the blue gets dense and dark and deep until it turns black. And that's how he got those emotionally striking skies. Okay. But if you use them just uh, for the surface value of the color effect, you can add blue to your images, orange, pink, red, green, whatever, you know, it's, it's fun. You know, um, John Wick, man, color, not necessarily on the lens, but certainly on the lights, right? I mean, John Wick is a really classic example of multicolored cinema lighting going on, right? They're not putting it on the lens itself. The lens stays neutral, but the key light might be blue or red because he's in a nightclub and he's looking for the bad guys and they're running around shooting each other. And the color of the lighting and the hardness and the contrast creates this sort of emotional adrenaline ride that you know you associate with a john wick movie and you go and enjoy it for that reason it gets you all excited and, and it's flashy and exuberant diffusion filters help you with the subtle details they help smooth things out give things a patina that's very beautiful and very inviting so you're going to want to use this on leading ladies in makeup commercials and romantic comedies romantic dramas um, you put diffusion on lights to soften it up and lower the contrast of the output of a light. So a light with no diffusion filtration on it will be really hard. It will cast hard uh, lines of, of, of transition, deep, dark shadows, bright lit highlights, uh, and very little difference in between, very high contrast. You put diffusion on that same light and all of a sudden you get a smooth transition from highlight to shadow. The shadows don't look quite as deep and dark. You can see detail in the shadows. The highlights on the skin are very soft and manageable and all that just from adding diffusion to the light itself, right? So diffusion has a couple of different uh, uh, roles that it can play. We'll talk about diff diffusion for lights in um, about two weeks. Uh, these are the super frost filters that I use. This is a demonstration video. I don't know how easy it's going to be to see the differences in super frost on this monitor. You can take a quick look and see if it's uh, discernible to you. Uh, I'll give you a hint. You know, here's the background back here, and it has varying degrees of softness. The branch in the foreground has some like lichens and and and. Um, uh, we call it moss on it and uh, it, it's sharper in detail and then this branch in the mid-range here uh, will have varying degrees of softness based on which filter is actually at play. So we got a basic uh, super frost and then we go through grades of one through four in this case uh, double zero. So here's no frost and then they add super frost. You see how the the shadow areas start to open up a little bit and they don't look quite as black. Here's no filter, look right here. And now with the filter, you see how the density one is very sort of smoky and it's lower in contrast. You can see more detail, oddly enough, with the diffusion filter. This is what Ira was talking about when he said it can extend the dynamic range of your camera. This is why I don't like YouTube most of the time, because they'll trap you with an argument and say, you, you have to buy this camera over that camera because that camera only has 11 stops of dynamic range and this camera has 15 stops of dynamic range. Yeah, except that that's only when your exposures are perfect, your lighting is perfect and your focus is perfect. The minute any one of those three things suffers, your dynamic range goes down. Okay. And if everything is perfect and, and equal, but the cameras are still a couple of couple of degrees off in dynamic range, like a um, like a, a Blackmagic Pocket HD camera versus 
um, a Panasonic GH5, you put a super frost filter on the Blackmagic pocket camera and all of a sudden it has just as much dynamic range apparently as the GH5. And all you did was add a diffusion filter, okay? So there's lots of different ways to skin a cat. If you understand the technology, understand the tools that are available to you and how to use them, um, specs are not as foreboding as they might otherwise be because you can fix it. You know, there's a solution for the drawback of 11 or 12 stops of dynamic range. Put a super frost diffuser on it. Okay. Um, it's a little hard to see, but uh, those are super frost. Um, here, uh, I photographed them really close up so you can kind of see the, gr the grittiness or the, the graininess of the diffusion filter. You see that? This is just dirt, but uh you see this sort of particulate that appears to be trapped within the the uh, resin of the filter itself that's actually the diffusion effect so it is possible technically speaking it is possible for a an image shot through a diffusion filter to look sharp and soft at the same time because in areas of the filter where there was no diffusion particulate working on the sharpness of the image, the light rays pass through unaffected. And so those areas of the image are perfectly sharp. But then at irregular intervals on the microscopic level, beams of light are being interrupted by these little particulate specks in the diffusion filter and redirected as a reflection angle and they become softer, right? So that's how you can apply a very light diffusion filter to an actress's skin, for instance, in a close up and remove the pores and the age lines around the eyes, but the image still looks, overall the image still looks sharp for the most part because the diffusion effect was selective in the way that it affected the overall image. It didn't reflect, it didn't affect every point of detail, only some of the detail because it's a very, irregularly organically applied diffusion effect to the filter itself. So that's it. This is a Tiffin uh, diffusion test, which I have put on your video page uh, in web courses and you can watch it. There's like uh, five or six different diffusion filters. They're gonna show you two, two women, a woman of color and a, and a, and a Caucasian woman and they're in a set with the same kind of lighting and the same exposure and the same kind of wardrobe. And then they just show you without a filter and with a diffusion filter and they'll tell you which one it is. And then they'll take it off again and then they'll show you another diffusion filter and you'll go back and forth between no filter and a new diffusion filter, back and forth, back and forth. And you'll see the effect of a variety of different Tiffin diffusers. And this can be a very interesting and informative video if you're at the point where you're willing to start trying diffusion, but you don't know what filters to try or where to start, this will, this will help you a great deal. Uh, it's a great video. I think it's about 30 or 45 minutes, but it's, it's very informative. It's very interesting. Um, check it out at your leisure. It's in web courses. Okay, so, oh, okay. Close-up diopters, these are interesting. All right, so let's say you wanna photograph, do an insert of a watch, right? So you guys had a, um, an assignment, um, it's due in a week or so. And one of the shots you have to do is an insert shot, right? So let's say you're doing the, uh, a close up of the watch, right? Well, this, this camera might have a minimum focusing distance of say two and a half or three feet because of the built-in lens and its limitations. Uh, you might say, okay, uh, in the film I'm doing, I'm going to have a lot of close-up work, so I'm not going to use an FC-1000. I'm going to use a, a Canon 60D, let's say. Uh, and I know that the 50 millimeter lens on the Canon 60D, minimum focusing distance is 1.5 feet, tells me right in the footage indicator. All right, 1.5 feet, that's pretty close. You know, that's, uh, you know, that's about like that, okay? But if you want to shoot a watch face with a 50 millimeter from that distance, the image is not going to be very big. It's not, the watch face is not going to fill the frame. So it's not going to feel like an insert shot. Okay. Uh, so what are you going to do? Well, you can rent something called a macro lens 
And usually um, that was a 50 millimeter Sigma that was on the 60D. A macro lens is usually, it could be 35 millimeters, 50 millimeters, 90 or 100 millimeters. The one uh, that I own, the one from the Rokinon Cinema Primes is a 100 millimeter macro and it'll focus down to like two inches. So if you wanna do a, a shot of a watch, because it's 100 millimeters, you don't need to get two inches away, but because it's a macro lens, you can shoot it probably from six or eight inches away and set it to minimum macro focus and that watch face will fill the frame because the macro lens is designed to get closer to small objects and make small objects look bigger than life size, right? Bugs, um, text on a cell phone as an insert, watch face as an insert, eyeball as an insert, right? When you wanna get really, really, really close to a subject and have it fill the frame, but it's very, very small, a dime, a quarter, right? And you want it to fill the frame, you need a macro lens or you can use what's called a diopter, a close-up diopter or a close-up filter. And so I've got a set of them here in 77 millimeter. And they exist as like a set of, it's basically like taking a magnifying glass and putting it in front of the lens. Let me show you uh, a really strong one so you can get a sense of what, it's, what it is. This one, I don't even use this one, it's so strong. <clears throat> but I'm going to show you the, plus, I think it's a plus four. Um, oh, it's a 10X. Uh, just to show you, you know, a very demonstrative example. You see how it looks like a magnifying glass for the front of the lens? And you can see how it, it actually, you know, it, it's like putting a magnifying glass in front of the lens, right? And so this will do the job in most cases as equally as well as a, as a macro lens, but a set of close-up filters is far less expensive than purchasing or renting a macro lens itself. The, when you get a macro lens, they cost a lot to buy and they're usually uh, premium to rent as well because it's a lens. But this is just a filter for all intents and purposes. So, you know, you can get buy a whole set of these off of Amazon for say 80 bucks, right? But my 100 millimeter macro was an $800 lens. So, you know, what would you rather do? And this is 77 millimeter screw on. So it would fit directly on my Sigma 50 millimeter lens, for instance. So I could take my lens hood and variable neutral density filter off the Sigma lens and I can put on the Vivitar 10X uh, close-up diopter. And now I have a 50 millimeter macro lens by virtue of adding that filter. In fact, you can kind of see <laughs> inside the camera, you can see the sensor all magnified, right? And that's a close-up. And now I could do that watch face probably from right here with this filter and have that watch face fill the frame. 10X is very strong. So if I show you, for instance, the difference between the 10X and the 1X or the 2X, you'll see that it's a, a difference in the protrusion of the, of the front element of glass. So let me just put that back together. Now, does it have the same quality as like a, a macro lens would have? Uh, for the most part, yeah. The difference is the macro lens, you know, for all intents and purposes, if nothing else, the 100 millimeter lens is a 100 millimeter lens. It just so happens that, you know, a traditional 100 millimeter lens might have a minimum focusing distance of three, three and a half feet or more. And a macro lens will get you into two inches, right? That difference in minimum focusing distance results in a huge difference in price between those two lenses, both to buy or to rent. Okay. So, but at the end of the day, it's also a 100 millimeter lens, like having another lens in your lens box. This doesn't make a 50 millimeter lens a 100 millimeter lens, but what it'll do is decrease the minimum focusing distance of that 50 millimeter from whatever it was natively to a new closer minimum focusing distance. So here is a uh, close up uh, number one, almost no effect, right? Just a little bit. 
it's about the same strength as my reading glasses. So my reading glasses have a plus one uh, factor for reading and for being up close when I'm looking at my computer monitor. This has basically, if I put this in front of my eye where my glasses would be, I can read my computer monitor perfectly, right? It's a very subtle effect, right? So you can go from plus one all the way up to plus 10, depending on how close you need to get to that flower or that watch or that dime or that bug, right? And you can also stack them. So some sets will be plus one, plus two, and plus four. You'll get three filters and a close-up set for like $49 on Amazon. If you stack a plus one and a plus two, you get a plus three, right? If you stack a four and a one, you get a five. A four and a two, you get a six, right? So you can use them in combination and increase the overall magnification effect. What that'll do though, you can't leave it on all the time. So you would say, well, why don't I just leave it on? Because a close-up filter, in the same way that it gets you really close to a small subject, it will deny you focusing out to infinity if you leave the filter on the lens. All right, so you won't be able to get the lens to focus properly for subjects that are far away because it's designed to get you close. So you only use it for close up insert shots and then for everything else, take it off and keep it in your camera bag. Okay, but this is a really, uh, this is a poor man's macro lens is essentially what it is, right? And for, for students, this is the way to go, baby, because if you have some of these in your, in your arsenal, you can get you know, whatever lenses they wanna give you in the rental uh, or the equipment room and don't worry about the minimum focusing distance. Uh, just put a diopter on when you need to get an insert done. We used to do that in the old days before the lenses started getting really, really exotic and, and the specs became super uh, capable on these cinema primes. I can remember uh, we always used to run with a set of close-up diopters for uh, the Panavision 50 millimeter lens that we used to seem to always get was an old uh, uh, reconditioned, rehoused uh, Zeiss Superspeed. And uh, it had a minimum focusing distance. I think it was of like two feet or 2.1 feet. <clears throat> and if you wanted to do an insert of a watch, pocket watch, watch face, whatever, uh, you couldn't do it with that 50 without adding a diopter. So we just, we always had them with us, you know, but nowadays, you know, digital cameras and the lenses are cheaper. We can have more lenses in our lens box. Even if we're renting, it's more affordable to have more lenses now because things are less expensive. So, but even so $40 versus 800 bucks, which would you rather do? You know, at least in the short term, it's a good, uh, it's a good solution uh what else is this a video let's see it is let's have a see i don't remember this let's see what this is here this is a proper tool shed isn't it this is where real men hang out not like me pansy anning around with cameras all day long now i wanted to talk to you some more about macro and close-up a dedicated macro lens is much like any other type of lens, except that it is a dedicated tool which allows you to get very, very close to your subject. And the closer you get to the subject, obviously, the bigger it becomes. But I just want to show you a very handy little accessory which will convert any ordinary lens into a close-up lens. And they're called close-up filters. You might be able to see here, I've got mine marked plus one to plus is if I try and take a close-up shot of this nut here with a spanner in the background, I'm just going to move that over a little bit. The closest I can get with this standard lens, this is an 18 to 70 zoom, the closest I can get to it is going to be about, let's see, and you see the focus isn't even beep, there we go. If you can hear the little beep, I'll find it. There it is, autofocus, take the picture. That's as close as I can get to that nut with this bog standard lens. But if I had a close-up filter, and you can probably guess for yourselves where this is going, here's the plus one, there it is, it allows me to sneak in closer and closer. If I add the plus one, which isn't of massive magnification, but it has some, here we go, I can get just that little bit closer. Make sure I recompose the picture the same. And you just kind of sneak in, listen for the beep of autofocus. And as long as you're getting a beep, you're getting closer 
But now, right, did you hear that? There's no beep when I touch the button. It means I'm inside the focusing distance of the lens. So I need to back off a bit. There we go, I've got a beep. Take the picture. And you flick between those two. See, we've just kind of like got that little bit closer, haven't we, and a bit bigger. <clears throat> Pop on the number two filter. And we'll get in a little bit closer still. Let's see what the 10 does. The focus is very accurate. I recommend you use it. Here we go. Back off. There it is. Yeah, you can see we're just kind of like sneaking in closer and closer. Now, the thing with these, and that is, you can stack them up. You just screw them one into the other like this. Now, I've lost number four, but I'm adding, uh, I've got a plus three, a plus one, and a plus two. Between them all together, that's giving me a magnification factor of plus six, which is quite a lot. You put a four onto there as well, you're into plus ten, aren't you? Which is very, very close indeed. Now then, let's see what's happening. Oh, that's really close. In fact, let's keep going. Here we go. Still getting in closer. In fact, it's now got so close, I can't get the spanner into shot, so I'm just going to move it because the field of view has narrowed. There it is. And... Now we're in very close indeed. So as you can see, let's just flick between them. We'll go from very close, we're going back out. The difference between all of them stacked together and the number three on its own is really quite phenomenal, isn't it? They're really some quite nice shots. And as I zoom right into them, I can see that they're very good quality as well. Pretty cool, huh? So that's close-up diopter. So the next one, next to last one I want to talk to you about is the neutral density. Okay, so this one was the one that I said was like putting sunglasses on your lens. Okay, so what we have in this little illustration here is... Um, a shot at the beach, right? I'll make it a little bit bigger here. So we got a shot at the beach and it's divided up into four strips. The strip all the way to the left is the image with a proper exposure and no ND filter, okay? And then we're gonna add one layer of ND filters, two layers, and then four layers of ND. And basically what you can see is it's like putting one set of glasses on, two sets of sunglasses, three sets of sunglasses. Okay, now we made a correct exposure to the left. So the idea of putting ND8 or four times uh, the exposure reduction in front of the lens would not be to make the, lens, the image dark like this. It would be if we couldn't achieve this through normal control of the camera. If we've made the aperture as small as we can make it, we've we've made the shutter as fast as we can make it we've made the sensitivity as low as we can make it and the camera still the image still looks too bright uh that's when we want to add these filters and basically darken up the image through filtration okay now with film cameras like i said in the past with film cameras the film stocks weren't as sensitive as the digital cameras are now I mean, we got digital cameras now that can shoot images virtually in the dark, you know, the, uh, Sony a7S three, uh, for instance. Um, but in order to gain that kind of sensitivity, we have to have a sensor that is super sensitive to light. And therefore the less light there is, you can still get an image to render on that camera. But if you have an abundance of light, which is the opposite of shooting in the dark, you have an abundance of light with a sensor that's super sensitive to light it's a disaster trying to shoot outside during the day uh, because you won't be able to adjust the camera down far enough to make to, to darken the image appropriately enough to get to this density in the first place that's when you need these neutral density filters it's like putting sunglasses on okay they come in calibrated densities so that you can determine exactly how much rate of reduction you're going to experience in your final image, okay? Here's an example um, of just swapping from nothing to a couple of different grades of neutral density filter. So this is the 
best I could do with a digital camera without adding ND. It was super bright out and it was very, very hard to get the sky to register to see clouds or detail in the sky at all. The minute you drop an ND filter, you're gonna see the whole, see that the whole image gets slightly darker. Now I can see the clouds, I can see the blue sky, I can see some of the reflection on the water has been reduced. If I pull it out, that's what I had. And if I put the filter back in, I get the effect that I want. Come on, drop it back in. There, there it is. Okay, drop the filter back in. I get my clouds back, I get my blue sky back, okay? Digital cameras are really, really sensitive. And so they'll, the images will blow out to overexpose very quickly on a, on a bright day at the beach. And so the ND filters are super important so you can manage the brightness and density of your images. Now I, ask, I also add a polarizer at some point. I think what I did was, yeah, I added a variable uh, density a polarizer, you can see how if you have the polarizer adjusted in one position, you get a nice density. But as you rotate the filter, it gets a little bit darker, but then it starts going the other way and getting brighter again because I turned it too far. You'll see it get brighter in a moment. In a moment. See that? Now I've turned the filter too far and I might have to dial it back again, or I dial it back and forth and I see the effects come on and come off until I get the sky the right density that I like, and then I stop turning the filter. You see that? So the polarizer has a variable effect. You can do that with a polarizer. You'll notice that there's no glare on the wave caps anymore, um, but there was glare on the wave caps in the beginning when I didn't have any filter at all. You see all that glare? Well, it's gone back here with the polarizer in place. So the polarizer got rid of the bulk of the reflection and it helped me darken up the sky and get my detail in the clouds back. All right, so polarizing filter is a lot like a neutral density filter in that regard. The neutral density filter though, doesn't reduce the reflection on the water. You see that I get my sky and my clouds, but there's still a lot of reflection on the water itself. You might like this effect. You might say, well, this is too much. Now the water is too dark. It looks muddy. It doesn't look inviting. So, okay, don't use the polarizer use the ND filter and keep some of that reflection in the water. So it makes the water look still kind of tasty, like you might want to get in and splash around, but you get your cloud detail back and you get your sky detail. So without the ND filter or polarizer, with the ND or with the polarizer. Sometimes you need both. If it's a really bright day, you know, if this was sand instead of water, oh, that's about it. If this was sand instead of water, I might need an ND filter and a polarizer just to reduce that much amount of light so that my camera could manage an, a, a normal looking exposure. Okay. So pick your filters based on what you're shooting, how you know, how you know your camera works and how you want to affect adjusting your exposure controls. Um, this is a Kelby video that is in web courses. You can watch it later. Uh, it's the BNH photo training program and they're talking about neutral density filters. This is a chart. This is ND filtration in general. I have highlighted for you in orange the specific areas that we're going to be dealing with in this class. In other words, um, exposure reduction in increments of one density, two density, three density, four, five, and six density. All right, all this other data and information is superfluous for this class, so don't even worry about it, okay? Just understand that there are a range of neutral density filters. They have upwards of four different names, four different ways of referring to the filters. The two ways that are the most common that you'll see most often are either ND, point something or ND2, ND4, ND8, okay? And these have relative meaning and it'll become clearer when we start talking about exposure and exposure control, okay? Just understand that an ND.3 is also the same as saying an ND2 filter. 
which will add one layer of sunglasses to your lens and reduce your exposure by one calibrated density. Okay. Now, some cameras, like this is a Sony FS5, all right? Um, the Sony FS5 that I used to have had ND filters built into the camera. And so you could add layers of ND filtration by turning a little knob. And if you had the lens off the camera and looked down into the lens port, you could see the glass filters dropping in front of the sensor. It was all internal, right? And that's okay, but when you have internal neutral density filters, that means you only get three, whatever the manufacturer could cram inside the camera. And then after that, you gotta add it to the outside of the lens like everybody else. Well, if you ask me, then I might as well start that way from the beginning, you know? Unless you're one of those folks that's convinced that their life is so busy and intense and their subject matter is so, so kinetic and chaotic that they don't have time to reach in their camera bag and pull out a filter and screw it on the front of the lens, uh, they're going to tell you they need a camera that has neutral density filters built in. And I tell you, if you're working that fast, you probably ought to think of a different client because you're working too hard, right? If you don't have time to pull a filter out of your camera box or bag and thread it on the front of your lens, you're working too hard, okay? So just consider that when you hear some of the rhetoric on YouTube where they'll tell you that the only good camera is a camera with built-in ND filters, to which I say, bollocks, okay? We have ND filters. You buy them at the camera store, like you buy your media and your lenses and everything else. It's part of your tool bag. You use it when you need it. And when you don't, you put it in the camera bag, okay? Because that's a part of being, of craft work, right? The camera can't be everything at all times for everybody. A good basic camera, which is what you have in the one we've selected for you guys to use in Cinematography 2, Ursa Mini 4.6K, has no built-in ND filters. Some people will tell you this camera is outdated, obsolete, and you couldn't possibly use it if you wanted to consider yourself a good cinematographer. To which I say, if you can't create a good image with this camera, then you're probably not a very good DP. Okay, because this is a very solid and capable yeah. capture device. And that's all it needs to be. It's a capture device and you need a battery and a lens and a map box and a viewfinder and a focus assist. You need all of those components to turn it into a cinema camera. And part of those accessories is a neutral density filter. Okay. Does that make sense to you guys? Because I hear that argument all the time on YouTube. Oh, this camera is no good. It doesn't have built in neutral density filters. What? What are you talking about? Why do you want them built in? Your, your selection is limited. You know, I'm not limited to anything I add to the front of the lens. I just need to have the right filter in my bag. So the solution there is make sure that when you do a movie, you rent the whole set of ND filters and don't forget and leave one out. Rent them all. So you have them and then you don't have to worry about that. <clears throat> okay, the polarizer I think is the last one I'm gonna talk to you about more or less. And here's the effect, reflection on the water, reflection removed, right? So we got this nice shot of the babbling brook here and you got the little polished stones uh, at the bottom of the pool and you can't see them when the sun reflects off the water until you add the polarizer and then it cuts right through all that glare and you get all this wonderful detail beneath the surface of the water. Okay, sometimes you might find that distracting and you like the reflections. If that's the case, don't use the polarizer. If you just need to darken up your image, then use the neutral density filter because the neutral density filter won't do anything to the reflections, but it will make the image darker if it's too bright. So sometimes you want the polarizer for what it does and sometimes you don't need it. All you need is an ND filter. All right. So here's the effect through a windshield. I think here it is. So I'm going to rotate oh, the. Yes. I was trying to figure out like what was Yeah, yeah. Yep, that's for Megan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That is. Um, Could you mute your mute? Your microphone, please? Back out. Like, I'm not sure. Yeah, so take care of what's going to happen. We'll, we'll find out. Let's see. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, Hi, I'm, I'm dropping off. Okay.
Hey guys, can you mute your microphones, please? And then something I kind of realized on the way over here is I didn't wipe the memory card. That's okay. That's okay. Okay, cool. So just yeah, leave it to yeah, I just as you have I that can, downloaded. Uh, you're mute okay. There we go. Can you guys still hear me? Or did I mute myself? Okay. <laughs> Sorry Wait. about that. I mean, we got folks, it sounds like they're at the equipment room renting gear. So I'm going to mute those microphones. If you want to ask a question, you'll have to unmute yourself at your end. So I'm going to show you a demonstration of what the polarizer does through the windshield of my car. So I'm going to turn the rear stage on the map box and you're going to see the reflection on the windshield kind of come on and come off. So here's the video and we'll show you what that looks like. So here's your polarizing. Whoops. Hey, hey, here's your polarizing effect. There it goes. As I turn it, you're going to see all of a sudden you can see through the window into the headrest and everything. Right now, we got all that reflected sky in the windshield. I'm turning it. And there you go. Now, if there was a driver and a passenger, I could see them both just fine through the windshield. They're a little dark. I might have to add some light to see them effectively, but I can now see them. And if I turn the filter back again, the reflection comes back and now I can't see them inside the car. And here's the thing, what's nice about the polarizer as you turn it, uh, you know, you might want an effect that's something in between the two extremes, right? So that you get a sense that you're looking through the window. Like there's a shot in uh, the movie Carol. Um, and that was um, uh, Ben Lawson, I believe, was the uh, cinematographer there. And uh, they're shooting a shot of, um, of uh, uh, oh gosh, what's, what's her name? Um, she played Galadriel in The Lord of the Rings. What's, what's her name? Um, Anyway, she's, she's in the car and, and the camera's mounted outside the car looking through the, the, the car window as she kind of muses and looks out at, you know, the, the landscape and the town passing by. And the idea was we want to kind of see her musing deep in thought. So we don't want to take all of the reflection off of the glass because then we just see her through the glass and we're not we don't get a sense of looking through the car window. What we want to see is we want to see her thinking about her situation as she daydreams out the window and we want to see the world passing by in front of her. So they allow a little bit of the reflection to be in the image as a, like a double image almost. And we see her through the window and we see the world passing by outside the window. And we get this metaphorical image that ends up having a deeper meaning than simply her close up through the car window. And, I, and if you haven't seen the movie Carol, um, I recommend it highly. It's an absolutely beautiful movie. And they pull out all the cinematography stops with that film. I mean, all the tricks in the trade are on display on the movie Carol. And check it out. It's very, very good looking film. Uh, okay, so polarizers. So that's the reflective properties. And now here's the color saturation properties of the polarizing filter. So on the left panel, we have a shot of a lighthouse and a normal blue sky with normal density on a cloudless sunny day. When you add the polarizer, look what happens to the blue in the sky and the red on the tile roof. Everything just like pow, it just pops, right? That's the other aspect of a polarizer. You see how it, it doesn't really do anything to a neutral shade like the white building. You can see that the shadow density is a little darker. So a polarizer, just like a pair of sunglasses, is going to darken the image slightly, but it doesn't introduce any false color. It only accentuates what's already there. So we have a blue sky that looks maybe a little muddy add the polarizer and it becomes this shockingly saturated blue and the red tile roof definitely looks dingy in the in the left hand panel with the polarizer we get this nice vibrant red tile okay so the polarizer has this sort of multi-leveled um applicability right removes reflections saturates color 
and it can act a little bit like a neutral density filter. Uh, this video is also on web courses. It's another BNH training video about using polarizers. And lastly, here's the neutral density gradual filter. So when we started this conversation, I talked about color grads for accentuating blue sky or the uh, Jeffrey Kimball, uh, Tony Scott, uh, Top Gun effect using the coral grad. Well, if a neutral density filter will give you an overall exposure change, a neutral density grad will give you an exposure change on the top half of the filter and gradually reduce the effect to nothing at the bottom of the filter. So just like a color grad, you can get a neutral density grad. So over here, here is a full ND6, top to bottom. So the sky got dark, the water got dark, and the rocks in the foreground got dark. But here's the same ND grad filter where only the clouds got dark, the water stayed normal, and the bottom of the frame where the rocks were stayed normal without any effect. So that if you need the foreground to stay at the value that it is, but you want the deep background, which is above the horizon, to be darker, that's a grad filter, neutral density grad filter. will give you sunglasses at the top and nothing impeding the image at the bottom. Does that make sense? This is a super duper handy filter. Um, it's as valuable as a polarizer, as valuable as a, an ND filter, but because it's a grad, it's a specialty filter. So here's an ND grad. If I show you against my little white card, you can see what it looks like. It's got sunglasses at the top and nothing at the bottom. You see that? So I can darken up the sky and leave the foreground alone or vice versa. Let's say I'm doing a shot at, on the beach in the sand and the sand is too bright, but this guy's just fine. Well, I can darken up the sand if I want and leave the sky alone. Okay. This is a very handy filter and it comes in the same grades as a traditional ND filter. So ND2, ND4, ND8. Okay. Grad. Okay. I like uh, the format brand because they come with this handy little filter wipe. You don't want to, if you notice, I've been grabbing all these filters by the edge, right? Because it's a piece of glass. And so if you grab it, you know, any old way, you're going to end up with fingerprints all over your filter. And then that might compromise the effect in some way. So when you handle filters, you should always handle them on the edge. Don't touch the glass itself. And so format gives you these nice little filter wipes with each filter you buy. You figure by the time you spent $300 on this filter, they can give you a $5 chamois cloth, right? <laughs> but it's, it's the little touches, right? It's the little things. So, and I like it because I always clean the filter off before I put it in the map box and use it. And then make sure the assistants handle the filters on the edges. And then before they put them away, I make sure the assistants give everything a nice wipe off and then put it back in the, in the filter wallet where it stays protected, little padded filter wallet. And then these go in my filter box and voila, there you have it. So um, that's it. So your ND grad, here it is again, working on the sky, but leaving the foreground the same density. You see how both panels at the bottom have the same density of foreground grasses, but this is without the ND grad and this is with the ND grad. We got nice cloud detail, deeper blue sky, and we can see all the detail in the mountains with the filter. And over here without the filter, we got a lot of overexposure happening. I'm not sure what this is. Oh, this is just another example of using an ND filter. All right, so next next uh, class, I'm going to talk to you about exposure, okay, which is controlling the brightness of the image to suitable levels. And the way that we can control that brightness has different sort of added on effect to what the image might look like. Um, so I want to talk to you about what is exposure control? What are the issues and variables in play? 
how do you control them? And then what are the results of changing certain variables instead of other variables? That's the conversation for Wednesday. Okay, and keep in mind that Wednesday, uh, your midterm quiz also opens. And so you have a quiz to do between Wednesday and Sunday of that of this week. So if I go over to web courses to the modules page, there you go. It's due on the 25th, which I think is Sunday, right? July, yeah. Yes, it's Sunday. So there you go. So you got a quiz to do between Wednesday after class and Sunday night, okay? Uh, there's no assignment for 1.7. Just do your reading and any review that you wanna do on filters because there will be a couple of filter questions on the quiz. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about exposure on Wednesday. And there might be an exposure question on the quiz from this lecture. Um, so you might wanna wait for this class to be over and then access the quiz and take the midterm, okay? So Wednesday we'll talk about exposure and hopefully we'll start tying some of these loose ends together and this stuff might start to make sense in a, in a, in a broader uh, sense, okay? Um, that's my discussion for today. So how does the topic of filters sit with everybody? Does anybody have a question or concern about what I've presented to you today? Um, I was interested in the ND filters. So the ND filter is like sunglasses for the lens, right? So it darkens the image up, helps when you're overexposed. Yep. Um, I don't know if this is more discussion for Wednesday, but is there such thing as like an inverse ND filter? So, it, so instead of darkening the image to compensate for overexposure. It would instead brighten the image in a low light exposure where you can't add a bunch of light. So, so, so something like um, Nightcrawler, right? Yes. Where you're shooting at night, you wanna keep it at night and you can't just add a bunch of lighting to the scene that isn't natural because then it would kind of mess up the, the look, but you still need to brighten it up to catch certain details. Is that something that's done in the um, ISO settings or is that is there some kind of filter that compensates for that or is that post-production? It's not a filter, it's camera control, which is the essence of exposure, okay? You can either adjust the sensitivity of your camera to see more image with less light, or you can adjust a control on the lens itself called an aperture. And by opening and closing the aperture on a lens, you can allow more or less light to pass through the lens and make the image brighter or darker. So that's part of the exposure conversation that we're gonna have on Wednesday. And this is part of the creative control that you must insist on having over your camera because your camera will make choices based on math and logarithms. And you might make choices based on emotion and passion and a way that you wanna see an image that might, not, that might be technically incorrect from an exposure point of view, but an image that is super bright might make perfect sense for your story, emotionally or aesthetically, uh, and it will conflict with the reasonable uh, assumptions about exposure that an automatic camera meter might make for you if you defer that control to the camera. That's why we don't want automatic control over our cinema cameras as a rule, because I think as a cinematographer with 30 years of experience that I know better what the image should look like than my camera. My camera is supposed to do whatever I ask it to do, not what it wants to do in spite of what I want, okay? So why would I turn control creatively over to that box when that's my job, right? I just need to make sure that when I ask the camera to do something, it's capable of doing whatever that is. And so I pick my cameras based on what they're capable of knowing that I'm going to play with it, manipulate it, and make it do things that might be seemingly unnatural to the mathematical mind, but make perfect sense to the creative mind. Does that make sense? So yeah. automatic so actually, is a crutch. Automatic is not for a professional. Right. Automatic is for somebody who is not comfortable exerting manual control over their camera at some point, and you're 
doing, you still want the enjoyment of creating, but until you watch the camera make choices for you enough times, you won't have a sense of what to do yourself and experience becomes your teacher. But if you've already, if you already know what these controls will do and you're a professional, you're want to, you're going to want to go in and make the adjustments on your own and just tell the camera what you need and have the camera perform for you. Typically too, with automatic, you'll have like different aperture settings in one shot. So you'll say if you're going from inside to outside or outside to inside, you'll have a totally out of whack image. So, yeah. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on. And so you need to keep track. You need to be aware of what those changes are, what's required, and you need to know how to expedite those changes and why, right? Which is why you're taking cinematography class, presumably. Um, and so that's part of, you know, learning how to do the job, you know? Uh, this is the training that you need in order to take that device and do some pretty amazing stuff with it. And then have developing a sense of taste in the process. So like, for instance, what I think is too bright in your mind's eye, you might say, that's perfect. I love the brightness of that shot, you know, and, you know, you might say, well, I want it darker, you know, and I'll say, no, that's, that's not right. You know, because my sensibility demands that the image look brighter and your sensibility says, no, it should be darker. And so we and that's subjective. Yeah. So we just get back to, you know, the uh, lighting for, you know, uh, Michael Bay. <laughs> it's just like, you know, right. Hey, yeah, right. The instinct is like, so it's that versus the you sort of in that situation, you were the camera, you were like, no, that goes against all logic. And then he's like, do it anyway. He does it anyway. And it, it works out. On right. that side, I told him I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted me, we were doing a shot of the, the, the SWAT cops assaulting the the drug dealers hangout and it was in the oh. middle of the forest in the middle of the night oh the one in the the one in the swamp right and we had a shot of a we had a shot of us a, a cop in the waiting on a a SWAT vehicle back in the trees waiting to give the signal to attack right and uh Mitch says this looks great you know we were standing by the camera he goes this looks all great I said well we should shoot it then so we can move on he goes well I, I know that if, if Mike were to come over here, he'd say, I want a 4K par in the background to give this, this person an edge light. And I said, an edge light from where, Mitch? It's nighttime and it's dark in the background. Where's the edge light coming from? He says, don't worry about the logic of it. Michael's style dictates that she have a crispy edge on her. And I said, Mitch, that's, that makes no sense to me. And he said, that's what he would want. And I said, you know what? I, I can't do that. I, that goes against everything that I believe would be right with this. I think it looks great. You said it looks great. Why don't we just shoot it? And he goes, Mike, just do it. And I said, damn it. And I put the light out there and I put the edge light on and I just said, I need to go get a cup of coffee. I can't, I can't watch this. I can't watch you do this. And so I left and I went to the crap service table and I left my, one of my guys in charge. And I just, I went and I sulked over at the coffee pot for a little while you know, but, you know, and, and then the funny thing is in the final, in the final edit of the movie, that shot didn't even make the final edit. So it wasn't, it didn't even make it in the final movie. So it was all for nothing. Right. But it was just the idea that, you know, I felt very strongly about something and, and he asked me to do the opposite to that. And it really tested me. Um, and I can tell you right now that I, that I owe, I owe Michael Bay a huge debt of gratitude for cracking my hard exterior and getting me to try things that were outside of my comfort zone because he did it more than once. And because of that, you know, I can say that I, I became, at that moment, I started to learn. It wasn't a complete transition overnight, but I started to understand the importance of not being so rigid in my sensibilities and don't hold on so tightly to it's just a movie, right? It's not like I'm being, you know, I'm, I'm not Job and I'm not being asked to kill my firstborn son. I'm just being asked to put a backlight on somebody that doesn't make sense. And who cares in the final analysis? It's just a movie. Right? I mean, it, yeah, if the cinema viewing pop, this is any indication with, you know, Fast and Furious, what up to nine at this point? Yeah, something like 
logic doesn't matter. I mean, if it looks cool, people will watch it. It kind of doesn't. <laughs> it really kind of doesn't, you know. Um, uh, I can tell you guys like uh, Larry Sure that shot the Joker. I did. I lit three movies with Larry. And one day Larry said, you know, I want to do this thing. And I said, that doesn't make any sense. He goes, what are you talking about sense? Goes, I don't care if it makes sense, Mike. I care if it looks good or not. If it looks good, then let's do it. And I'm like, oh, well, who can argue with that? Go ahead. We'll, you know, add that light, you know, and we did it. But, you know, so some cinematographers are not concerned with the literal meaning or the literal relationship in something. They're more emotional in how they approach the problem of lighting and shooting. And so sometimes you're going to do things that seem weird, but in the, you know, you go to the after party or you go to the premiere party and you see the movie and you're like, you know what? Sure. Why not? Look pretty good. You know, at the time I didn't see the logic in it, but now I understand it was an emotional choice, you know, and, and those are subjective choices that we make sometimes they make sense sometimes they don't the beauty of working with a variety of different cameramen uh in the course of your career is what's going to inform you and give you a sense of what looks good and what doesn't look good because you're going to have all those opinions to weigh in the balance when it's finally your turn to be cinematographer and you have to make some decisions and you're going to and the director's going to say, I want this emotional response in the audience. So let's do something to the lighting that'll make them feel that way. And then you go back into your memory and you sort of pick the way that you liked the best and you try it, you know, and maybe add your own personal little twist on, on the result. And, and that becomes your style. That becomes what, you know, differentiates you, differentiates you from the rest of the pack. Right. So, but that's a broader topic for conversation. So how would we feel about filters? Pretty good? At least until Wednesday, yeah. we can talk more about ND and exposure. Okay. Um, I did have a question. Um, so do you normally use filters like on set or do you kind of push that to the post-production? Well, Tiffin has a, uh, what they call the Tiffin digital filter set or digital filter pack, I guess it's called. And it's a plugin for like Final Cut or Premiere Pro. And it has very nearly all the filters in the Tiffin catalog and you can apply them digitally on your timeline in your, in your NLE, right? But like I said, certain filters like diffusion, polarizers, um, there are digital options that'll do those things as a plug-in in your NLE, but they don't, they don't work as well as the real filter in front of the lens at the moment of creation of the image, right? It's different. So um, you pick your battles, right? You know, if you say, okay, I'll only do, I'll do color correction in post. I'll do, um, you know, I can do certain lighting effects in post, so I don't have to worry about them in camera. And then certain filter effects, if I need them, I'm going to do them in camera because they're going to look better. And I just need to make sure everybody's on board with it, you know. And usually with diffusion, the question is usually answered in the camera tests and pre-production before the movie actually starts. You get the, say it's the actress, right? And so say, you know, say you have an actress that's getting a little bit older and she's got pronounced uh, uh, pores in her face and she's starting to get age lines, laugh lines, we call them around the eyes and around, you know, see how I got a, a, a deep line of demarcation from my nose to my dimple when I, when I start to smile, right? That's the sign of somebody whose face is aging, right? And so maybe you want to help reduce that with a diffusion filter and a certain style of lighting. Well, we'll sort that out in pre-production. We won't spend an actual shoot day solving that problem. We'll have that figured out in pre-production by doing camera testing. Okay, and that's very that's a very important part of the process. You don't want to solve a fundamental problem like that uh, on the day when you've got so much other stress affecting your mind and in your decision making faculties. You want to have as much technique and procedures sorted out in pre-production as you can. And usually diffusion for the actors and actresses is a question you've already addressed and you already know what you're going to do on the day. And then if you decide for some reason not to do it, 
you can always forego the filter, but in pre-pro, the testing seemed to indicate that you wanted to use a black pro mist one quarter on any close up of your leading lady or your leading man, whatever the case may be. And you just apply that solution because you've already tested it and you know what it looks like. So as far as testing, um, do you like, I guess, bring the actress in before shoot days and then just test the camera on her? Yeah, for sure. Um, I did uh, Mini Driver uh, in a movie um, called uh, Take, and we did uh, we did about four days of camera testing on Mini, and then her leading man was Jeremy Renner. I only needed a day to figure out what Jeremy's lighting needed to look like, but we had you know a good solid three four days with Mini, um, and I remember <laughs> when we were on set doing the camera tests her publicist was standing right off my shoulder right here and i'm trying different key lighting and we were i was working with a china ball and a softbox and a couple of other solutions and i'm doing something and and she walks up behind me kind of like this and she's like so what can you do to narrow minnie's jaw and i said excuse me <laughs> she said well minnie has such large and I said she's got big cheeks doesn't she she says yeah and she's real self-conscious about it is there anything you can do with the lighting to narrow up her face a little bit you know to which I said well I'll do what I can but at a certain point it is what it is I said personally I think she's a very beautiful woman and therefore I want to see her in all of her splendor but there are things that I can do to try and make the lighting appear to have a narrowing effect on her face but it's only going to have so much, you know, efficacy. And then it is what it is. And she said, well, just do what you can. Right. And so we worked it out for several days, you know, certain kinds of gel, certain kinds of color gel for the lights, diffusion gel for the lights, position of the key light. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, you can place a key light in such a way that it makes the face look fuller and rounder or thinner and, and skinnier, you know, narrower but depending on where your key light is coming from, okay? And so you work those things out in pre-production during camera testing so that on the day when the location is on the, on the time clock and the crew is all on the payroll time clock and you, know, you gotta get the call sheet done and there's 15 shots that need to be done before you can wrap. And that you, the last thing you wanna do is lose time sorting out the issues for a problem that you could have fixed in pre-production by doing camera testing. So test, test, test before you shoot. So you have a plan going in. You can always throw that plan away, but you should have a plan going in, okay? Uh, on the grounds of a uh, diffusion too, I just have a like, for fun kind of question. I don't know if I picked this up falsely or if it's true or whatever. Uh, the classic shot, like a woman coming down, bright, like white dress, whatnot, coming down stairs, um, do they put Vaseline on the lens to accentuate the, the lights coming off? You can, yeah. In fact, Koken had a Vaseline filter. By the way, while I have it in my head, Kate Blanchett was the actress I was trying to think of before, and I'm just terribly remiss in not remembering her name. But yes, Koken had a Vaseline filter. Um, we used to do what we call the nose grease filter uh, when I was a camera assistant, which was we'd take an optical flat, and we would get a little nose grease off and smear the filter like that. You can't see what I just did to the filter, but it's enough of an effect. When I drop that in the matte box, any spectral highlight that hits your subject within that zone on the filter is going to get kind of a stretched out highlight, almost like, a, almost like an anamorphic flare. And if I do it top to bottom, the streak will go this way. If I do it side to side, the streak will go that way, right? And that was just getting a little nose sweat and just on an optical flat, just like that. You can kind of see where I streak the filter. You can almost sort of see it right, right in there, right? It's just enough, you know, straight through the filter and you can't really see what I did, right? But if light hits it from the right angle, bang, that highlight will stretch right across the frame, okay? That was called the nose grease filter. <laughs> That's something you won't hear in a textbook. <laughs> is, is that still used today? Yeah, 
Absolutely. It's the quickest, easiest way to do that effect. If you don't have the filter in the box, you know, <laughs> you know, the camera operator will turn to the first AC and say, did you bring the nose grease filter? Yes, sir. I got it right here. It's an optical flat and a little bit of sweat off my brow. <laughs> God, I love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't thought about that in a long time, actually. That's pretty funny. The nose grease filter. That's a real thing. But you won't find that in focal press. It's too embarrassing. Anything else? Anybody got any questions, thoughts? Uh... Um, I did have a quick question about the uh, shooting assignment that we're mm. working on. Um, for the shots, you do you do want some sort of overall like theme? I, I know it's supposed to be for like a technical thing of like showing composition and showing the the focus throws, but you know try but it would be it's encouraged to try and make it some kind of cohesive miniature narrative you know to make the shots kind of make sense it presents better if the f images have some relationship to one another okay um it's you know like i said you get in this education what you put into it you get out what you put into it you know you can give me a handful of just slapdash images that will satisfy the assignment but would you want to show them to a client? Are they good enough to put on your reel? You know, if you're going to do something, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. So if you have the time and you can get yourself set up and give me, you know, I'm asking you for five images. I mean, I've already got one assignment handed in and it was beautiful. It was fine. It looked great. And all the images were, you know, if, if I thought about it, I, there was a, there was a little bit of a story happening between the images. It was a guy and a girl sitting on the sun deck, getting a little uh, tan and the girl comes out with a bag of M&Ms and the guy's like, Hey, what do you got there? You know? And it was just a series of shots that told that story in the prescribed fields of view that I asked you for, because this is a conversation that you might remember from editing. It's all about how you tell a story with a series of images. A close shot means something to the audience. A wide shot tells the audience something. A medium shot, a raking two shot. These shots in their basic compositional uh, value communicate to the audience and they help tell that story. So I want, I want to see, I want to get a sense of your framing sensibility. You know, just show me a wide shot. What is it? Show me a medium shot. Show me a close up. Show me an insert, right? And tell me a little story in the process. Cause I want to, I want to see how your mind is working. Cause I'm going to break that and rebuild it so that you understand coverage and shooting for the edit. And you start and you understand the traditional framing expectations of a wide, a medium, a close up, right? And right. build you back up with a traditional cinematic education so that everything you shoot is going to work the same way every time, no matter what it is. You're always going to have mediums, wides, close ups, inserts, right? If you have a terrible sense of framing, then you're always going, your communication with your audience is always going to be slightly off. So we have to show you how to manufacture these shots in a way that your audience expects to see them. Right. Okay. okay. Don't give me a medium, a loose single when I want a big close up. All right. right. This means something different than this. It speaks different words to the audience in the visual language. Right. Right. Okay. So I want to um, see how you do that. Yeah. And ju just one more clarification um, in the, in the assignment notes, um, where it's talking about the different throws. Yeah. Um, just to confirm, you do Throw. want us to do- all... Focus throws. Yeah, yeah, the focus throws. Um, you do want us to do all three throws, correct? Yeah, do a fast one, a slow one, and something slow. in between. Okay, because I was thinking I could I incorporate that. The timing looks like. Yeah. Some and, people and... don't get a slow, they don't get it. They just whack. They go from one to the other, whack, whack, whack. Well, yeah. whack means one thing to the audience. And slow means another thing to the audience. Right. And that's what, know that that's you what I figured. Both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because in, in my setup, I, I don't know. I, I posted on the discussion. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, I'm thinking I, I've actually gone back and revised it. And I'm thinking to incorporate all the focus throws. It could be like the character, something in the foreground. He looks at, you know, slow, slow to look at it. Medium back to him. Yeah. He, so you yeah. see he wants it. And then when he reaches for it, maybe go for the fast. You know, sure. just like he quickly. Absolutely. 
something like that. I just want to make sure that was within the purview of the assignment. I wasn't getting off on some tangent. No, it's, it's hard to get off on a tangent on a focus throw. It is or it isn't working, right? I just want to see where your your sensibilities lay and if we need to tweak it at all. That's uh, that's all that that assignment's really about, right? Um, if you need to work on it, we'll, we'll figure out how to, you know, make you better at it. By the time you get to cinematography two, I'm going to thrash you so hard every class period that you're going to know it leaving school. Uh, or die trying. Um, I had a question about the assignment as well. Um, yeah. Do we get like bonus points if we add like sound design and score? Nope, I'm not an editor. I'm not a music supervisor. I don't know what that means. What's sound anyway? What does that mean? <laughs> I mean it nothing. It means nothing. <laughs> get no extra credit for soundtrack. I could care less about sound. My whole career was silent. <laughs> Somebody no, else's no. problem. We'll, we'll do like little, little word slides, like a silent film. Two, two <laughs> words, Buster, Keaton, go. <laughs> All right, somebody says sound, I said, what's that? <laughs> okay, that's why God made ADR, automatic dialogue replacement. You do it in post, right? In fact, there's a lot of TV shows that were shot in the 60s and movies that were shot MOS without sound, mit out sound, that's the German reference. Uh, and all of the dialogue was overdubbed in post because the microphone sucked, <laughs> but the cameras were fine. They could record a beautiful image, you know, but the location was too hard, too difficult to capture sound in. The sound sounded better on the studio and they would do ADR and Foley. Foley was sound effects that were done in post-production, you know, so the, the old, um, old movies and you might be able yeah. to detect it. The original um, Star Trek series had so much of that where um, you, could, you could, you yeah, not all of it, but there were certain points where you could just, you could literally hear right where they had cut in. Like they had the normal ambient sound going on and then you could hear where they had just cut in the recording from the booth. And it's just like, you could tell it's not in the in the scene at all. It's like, uh, is he, right. like it's too clear. It's like, oh, they matched it beautifully, but it's just too clear. That's right, that's right. So um, yeah, in my world, the cameramen did camera things and the sound guys did sound things and neither the twain shall be. All right. Just for the, for the shooting assignment, do you want like dialogue also or are you just more focused on like the... I don't need anything but a picture, man. Okay. In fact, the first four shots could be stills if you're really pressed for, you know, getting a hold of a video camera or whatever, but... Uh, mm -hmm. I have no, I'm not. <clears throat> Um, yeah, the focus throw sure. has to be video. The focus throw definitely has to be a motion artifact. Mm -hmm. you can't show me with stills. But mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I say, you know, take advantage of it. Like I said, this is a cinematography class in a mm -hmm. film program. If you're going to do the bare minimum work now, how do you expect that approach to your your work ethic uh, moving forward? You, you're not gonna you're not gonna get very far if you're gonna do the minimum work all the time. No, of course. Yeah, I was planning on doing the video. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't like, yeah, a, like dialogue or something that was needed because I don't have like sound equipment for that. Cinematography class, baby. Mm -hmm. what, what are microphones? I don't understand. <laughs> right. The microphone so, is that mm -hmm. thing. Wrote in my shot. Get out of here. <laughs> the boom mic coming in. <laughs> shoot something that you might be able to put on your reel in capstone class, you know, mm -hmm. something that looks really good and you, you know, and you're out hunting for a job as a camera assistant when you get out of college and you show somebody you're real, you know, they'll say, wow, this looks really good. Did you shoot all this stuff? Yes, I did. You know, don't show me your transformer toys from when you were eight, right? This is sure. college, man. Go out, solicit help, find some people that want to appear in front of the camera. You know, why don't you guys, you know, here's my thing. I'm like, Go to the theater department and ask some of those drama students that want to become actors if they need images of themselves that demonstrate how they can perform and collaborate with those people. They were born to be in front of the camera and you were born to be behind it. Put, pull your resources together and shoot something you both can benefit from. You can give a copy to that person as their acting reel and you keep a copy for your cinematography reel. Right. And if you're trying to be a director, try to direct them a little bit and get a little performance out of it. You know, use any assignment in any of your classes, not just this one. Every time you're asked to produce some content 
and have it evaluated for a grade, you should be doing it thinking about a potential job opportunity in the future, a client. Would you be embarrassed to show your work to a client or does that work speak to your, your qualifications? Mm -hmm. your talent, right? Right. And, you know, beyond that, it's all about time constraints and accessibility, right? So find some gear to work with, find some help to help you and uh, make sure you get it turned in on time so you don't, your grade doesn't suffer. And then beyond that, beyond that, create as 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 good a, a a piece of content as you can. For sure, I will. For sure. That, that's the order of importance, anyway. In the real world, right? You got a call sheet every day. We got to get fifty shots done in twelve hours. So you're like, oh my god, I can't make art fifty times today. I got to make fifty shots. So maybe I can make art three or four times today. The rest of it's got to look good enough to make the edit uh, and has to be good enough for, to finish on time. But beyond that, I can't waste time anywhere being precious. I got to get it done. That's what a cinematographer's job really is. I got to get it done and have it look good. And I get one serious opportunity before lunch and one after lunch to make a steaming pile of art. And then after that, it has to be good enough to get the job done, but not precious right so that's the, the the delicate balance there that's happening as a cinematographer the producers are going time is money time is money time is money and the director's like but i want art but i want art you know and the crew's going oh we're using too much equipment you know and you're going yeah but if we have one more light it'll look so much better than without you know you're constantly fighting against those two extremes and it's, it's can be, it can be a difficult place to to exist some days but that's the job it's what it is i'm stealing that saying uh seeming pile of art that, that's pretty good <laughs> i'm fu i'm full of them today aren't i go, go start a go start a nice little indie studio you know like uh, neil bob camp's got a what's its face that that does all his work um i don't remember the name of his studio right now but you, that's the motto making we make steaming piles of art yeah, it's it's kind of an old saying. It's you know, I don't know who's responsible for it, but it's that saying is older than me. So, um, anyway, well, I, I love it. It's good. Uh, I do have to hop off though. I've got another class like coming up here, like thirty minutes or so. But yeah. Thank you. So, shall we adjourn? Yep. All right, yep. fellas, folks, ladies, and gentlemen, thank you for your time and attention. Don't forget, you got a quiz opening after class on Wednesday, and I'll see you Wednesday for exposure. All right. Thank you, Thank you sir. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.